Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the third part of our series, What If Deku Became a Dad at Young Age. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Lest at 719 from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. The silk blindfold covered her eyes, she was unable to see him, but his touch told her all she needed. Her arms were tied above her head to the notch on her headboard, her entire body quivered in anticipation of where he would touch next. She felt the silk sheet being pulled from her body slowly, revealing her nakedness to the room. Such a thought would typically make her feel vulnerable, but his presence made her feel alive. She could feel her blood boiling in sheer anticipation of his next touch. The feather began at her ankles and lightly danced its way up her body. Her skin dimpling and quivering under its touch, she felt his warmth lie next to her on the bed. Light kisses began to dance upon her neck. Soft moans escaped her lips as she writhed against the restraints. The feverish excitement he ignited within her made her feel like she would burst into flames at any moment. Naughty girl, his warm, husky voice whispered into her ear, Do I need to tie your legs as well? No, I can be good, she moaned, I promise, but please let me feel your lips. She could feel him shift as his lips lightly grazed hers. She would move forward, hoping to capture them, but he would pull back just out of reach. She could feel his manhood hot and heavy resting against her side. The ache intensified between her legs as she longed again to feel him inside her. His mouth again found her neck more profound and lustful, his teeth light grazing the skin, causing her intense moans to grow. Trailing down, he captured her luscious breasts in his mouth, causing her back to arch off the bed. While one was in his warm mouth, the other was teased by his hand, all the while, the feather danced over her sex, driving her closer and closer to the ultimate summit of pleasure. She never expected him to have such control over his quirk, he always seemed to be able to take it up a notch in the bedroom. She was oh so thankful for it. His kisses trailed down her stomach to her pelvis, she spread her legs open for him, begging for him to kiss the very core of her womanhood, when she felt his tongue dance upon the edge, she could feel the explosion about to erupt. He would pull back and tease her, she shivered and writhed under his sensual kisses. He would expertly guide her to the edge but did not let her take the final plunge into the sea of erotic satisfaction. Please, Izuku, she begged, please bring me to release, I have for your manhood like nothing before, please baby, I have been a good girl, reward me with throbbing manhood. She could picture it so clearly there at the entrance to her sex. As you wish, he replied. No words were sweeter to her ears as he felt his rigid, throbbing member against her quivering womanhood, she could feel him begin to push past the entrance. The reward of the final plunge was tantalizing close, with one single thrust, he would drive her over the edge. The sound of her alarm clock jolted her awake, Momo bolted upright in bed, her most recent book of romance tumbling off her chest. No rope to bind her, no blindfold to rob her of sight, no feather dancing across her body, and no Izuku to relieve the incredible ache between her legs. The dream was still there dancing across her mind, making sure the door was locked. She decided she needed to address this situation post-haste. As her eyes closed, her hand trailing between her thighs, the dream was right there to draw upon. Quickly, she hit play on the phone, music filling the room to drown out her calling his name as she found orgasm. Again, again, and again. Momo, fresh from a shower, descended the stairs toward the kitchen. She was, of course, running late due to unexpected circumstances. Yesterday during the alert, when she was pressed against him and had opened her top to make the bullhorn for him, that feeling hadn't left her all day. She had tried to push it away, just like her thoughts of how at least she was wearing a nice bra. The dream was not just last night but others that she had, the feeling of him against her yesterday or when they hugged. His presence made things seem better, lighter, and warmer. She wanted to spend time with him, to be around for Inari, sing her to sleep, and chase away any bad dreams that little girl may have. Be there when she woke up and set her off on the day with love and a full belly, she wanted all this and to wake in the arms of Izuku. She knew she had had a crush on him since the incident, but her therapist had warned her that it could just be caused because he had saved her from a dangerous situation and did not immediately act upon it. She did her research and found it to be a genuine phenomenon. Not wanting to put them through, she decided to get to know him better, and as she met Inari more, she knew that she needed to be sure before doing anything. Izuku was a father, which meant Inari was part of the package, and Momo didn't want to come into their lives only to leave because she realized she couldn't handle it or that her feelings were false. So, she approached it from the avenue of friendship, and it just continued to blossom and grow. The best part of her day was Izuku and Inari. There was no doubt about that. Now she knew it, yesterday had confirmed it, she was in love with him. She wanted to be with him and be a mother figure to Inari. Due to her tardiness, she knew he would not be downstairs at this time, which was good as the dream, and her recent actions still danced in her mind, even now, causing her a slight blush. In the kitchen, she saw the rest of the girls from her class sitting around the bar top eating breakfast. She could tell immediately that it was Izuku's doing, and she could feel the pout coming that she had missed it. Kayoko could see the heiress pouting slightly, causing the rocker girl to smile. Morning, Momo, don't worry about breakfast. 
Your boyfriend left a plate in the microwave for you and this little knot here, she said, waving a folded piece of paper. Should I just toss it aside, or do you want it? Momo sputtered, turning even more red as she finally responded. He is not my boyfriend, and I would like to read that note, please. She said, walking to take the note. It may have something to do with Inari. The other girl started giggling as Momo took the note from the smirking Kayoka and quickly opened it to read it. Momo, sorry I missed you at breakfast this morning. I made food for everyone, but I made a special plate for you. It is in the microwave. I hope you are feeling okay. If not, let me know, and I will check on you at lunch. I wanted to ask if you were free this Sunday. I wanted to take Inari to the park and out for the day. We missed you at breakfast. Please message me so I know you are all right. Inari and Izuku. P.S. Cream is in the fridge yellow bowl. Momo blushed, thinking about spending the day out with them before she opened the microwave and saw that while the others had pancakes, two blueberry Belgium waffles were sitting in there with eggs, bacon, sausage, and hash browns. She even spied fresh blueberry compote. She couldn't help but giggle as she said it to reheat and went to the fridge pulling out her fresh whipped cream for the waffles. What was that about him not being your boyfriend? Mina asked, taking a bite of her pancake. I don't know what you are talking about, Momo said, trying to suppress her blush but not doing a very good job. Do you like him? Achako asked nervously as she had a date with him, Seri. She didn't want to cause trouble if he was already involved. Yes, as a friend, I like him very much, you all see how he is a good person. What is there not to like, Momo said, sticking to her cover story. Well, then that means he is fair game, right? Mina said. Why yes, he is, Momo said, getting up to get her food, he is his own person and makes his own decisions. She didn't see Achako's smile, but the others did. That's good because he is rather cute, Kiro, Sue said, placing her plate in the sink. Sue, Kayoka called out. What you said so to the other night, Sue replied, throwing her friend under the bus. Well Kayoka, Toru asked. Okay, who here doesn't think he is at least cute? She said, when there was silence, she just smiled. Of all the boys, he is the cutest and hasn't stuck his foot in it like many others. You got that right, Toru said. Minta, Denki, and Siro are so out right now. That Hugo would be hot if he weren't such a prick, Mina said. When the other girls looked at her, she shrugged. He has that whole bad boy vibe, but he is such an asshole that I would rather date my sock. Shoto is cute but so standoffish, Toru added. Tenya, to stiff, they all responded at once, causing laughter to break out. Midoriya wins by default, Mina said. Fumikage is handsome, Sue said. I like his vibe. They all just turned around and looked at Sue. What? She said with a shrug. I say what's on my mind, causing more laughter. Momo focused on eating her food as her mind drifted to what the others had said. She didn't want Izuku to be free, she wanted him to be hers. But something was nagging at her, and it was named Itsuka Kendo. Itsuka Kendo. Perfect morning, absolutely perfect. She was greeted with a good morning photo of Inari, a bare-chested Izuku, and an invitation to breakfast. It was just the three of them, peaceful and just great. She even had the field of flowers dream again, but this time it was uninterrupted and perfect. Now here she was, walking towards the daycare, holding Inari's hand and swinging her over any cracks that happened to be in the princess's way. And the world kept smiling down on her, he had just invited her to spend the day out with him and Inari, though he did mention Momo. She could live with that, nothing would put a damper on this morning. After the drop-off and perfect goodbye kisses, they walked beside each other with friendly banter and some shoulder bumps. He took her on a roundabout way toward their classes, leading her to a coffee cart that she didn't know existed. She saw some of the upper-level students in the area. He remembered her order, didn't let her pay, and even purchased a pastry for them to share along the way. As they walked under the shade of the trees, the only thing that could have made it perfect was for him to pull her behind the tree and capture her lips with his. Her mind clamped onto that fantasy and started to run with it like a fat kid running with a cookie. When they entered the campus building, she dreaded knowing that they would have to split apart to go to their separate classes. But when he walked her to her the door of his before saying his goodbye, she swore that there was no way he couldn't hear her heart thumping against her chest. She entered class in her little world, sitting at her desk with her coffee, she absently plopped the last of the pastry in her mouth in bliss. The sound of someone snapping their fingers by her head finally brought her back to her Izuku-less classroom. Set was grinning at her. SSSOOO, we missed you at breakfast this morning. She said in an overly dramatic tone. Now here you are, all lost in a daydream, drinking fancy coffee and eating a pastry. Now either someone slipped out after hours for a naughty rendezvous or woke up early for a little bit of morning delight. Her eyebrows wiggled suggestively. Itsuka first blushed at the innuendo, then had to keep her mind from running off again with either of those fantasies. She quickly snatched back the cookie to keep the fat kid focused. Or I met up with my best friend and got otter for breakfast, walked her to school, and was shown this wonderful little coffee cart on campus. I assure you, set, there was naughty rendezvous or morning delight. Unless a wonderful breakfast and charging up my Inari gauge counts, then yes. I will buy your excuse for now, madam, set said, sitting back with a grin. But I assure you, Detective Setsuna the Great is on the case. Itsuka just laughed and sipped her heavenly coffee. She mentally noted that she was thankful Ibarra was not a mind reader at that thought. Today was almost perfect. Vlad-sensei walked into the class, and they immediately quieted down. 
perfect class. First, some announcements due to the break-in yesterday. There has been a shift in the schedule. Friday's heroic class will now be a joint training session with one as their rescue training has been rescheduled. Both classes will have their rescue training together on Wednesday. So please prepare for a long day as we will have much to go over. What kind of training will we have on Friday? Nito asked. It will be four on four with two members from each class, so I want you to do your best and ensure you work together. I want to show one of what teamwork looks like. Yes, S-E and S-E-I. They shouted back. Itsuka was giddy at the thought of spending Heroic's class with Izuku. She would finally be able to see him in his costume, and he would see hers. She wondered what his reaction would be. She hoped he would at least look at her legs and always compliment them. Friday couldn't come fast enough. Sadly, her next sip of coffee would be the last as the cup was empty. She was focused enough to make it through class but couldn't keep the smile off her face. Even Nayato going on about how they should all work together to dominate 1A and show them who the superior class was, didn't bring her down. Momo. She quickly thanked Izuku for breakfast and assured him she was fine, she had overslept. She nibbled on her thumb, smiling when he told her that Inari missed her at breakfast. She surprised herself when she sent, was she the only one? A simple no, she wasn't the only one. It made her feel like she would float away. Good text, Kayoka asked. Momo nodded before she could stop herself. Quickly, she composed herself. It was just something cute. Inari was looking for me at breakfast. She slipped her phone into her pocket. That's sweet, Kayoka said. Soon, the girls were absorbed in conversation about school and adjusting to the new environment. Momo would be lying if this wasn't something she had dreamed about, being just one of the girls, not being treated differently than anyone else. Upon entering the class, she spied him immediately. She walked over. Thank you for breakfast, Izuku, she said. It was excellent. She smiled at him and made her way to her desk. Mina glared at him. Izuku responded with a raised eyebrow before the purple-haired boy turned around to face the front of the class. Midnight entered in perfect step with the bell, the morning announcements of the change to their heroic schedule due to the break-in, and the team exercise for Friday dominated the information. Midnight encouraged her class to work together and said that the goal of Friday's class was to show how well they could integrate as a team. Midnight explained how, much like their 2v2 battles, they would never know whom they would have to team up with in the field and that learning to integrate quickly was crucial to victory. Lunch, found Itsuka, Momo, and Izuku falling into their all-familiar dance of securing food and making their way toward their lunch table. Momo watched as this all played out in front of her. She focused more on Itsuka as she tried to figure out the dilemma in the back of her mind. Does Itsuka Kendo have feelings for Izuku beyond friendship? If so, how does Izuku feel? Something slowly dawned on Momo. Itsuka was Momo's best friend, and she looked forward to talking with the girl most days. They had bonded over the time they knew each other before school, and if anyone was currently holding that spot, it was Itsuka. Itsuka knew everything that had happened, all about Momo's childhood. The two girls spent much time together, and they both cared deeply for Inari, and now the question was how they felt about Izuku. Feelings were complicated. Scenarios played in her head, Momo confessing to Izuku and he rebuking her, embracing her, Itsuka rebuking her, embracing Izuku. She chased the thoughts from her head. For now, maybe the first step was to converse with Itsuka. Itsuka Kendo. A perfect morning translated into a good day and evolved into a beautiful night. Itsuka found herself sitting on the bench behind the Wana dorms as the squeals of laughter warmed her heart. Inari was having a grand time on her playset, running around with Fumikage, Aijiro, and Mina. She had just enjoyed a wonderful little dinner with Izuku and Inari. She knew the setting sun would reluctantly call her back to her dorm but she would bask in this simple but special day for a little longer. She leaned over and rested her head on his shoulder, she is having so much fun. Yay, she is, Izuku said, apparent happiness in his voice. I am so surprised how everyone has taken to her, even those that don't want much to do with her are still nice to her, and all the girls love her. She is the perfect ambassador, you heard how she made friends with, like, my entire class the other night, Itsuka said. Just let her speak for me, then. I don't know if I could afford all the apple juice she would make me buy, he said, chuckling. Reluctantly she lifted her head off his shoulder, Ajiro. Nothing, Izuku replied. He has been quiet and distant ever since the battle trials, I did go off on him. He deserved it, that asshole. That he did but we will see what happens from here on out. You ready for heroic class tomorrow? She asked. I don't know if I want us to be on the same or opposite team. I don't either, he laughed. You know what? We need to get together and spar, I miss those days. Maybe we can work something out. She said the thought of alone time sounded pleasing. Mina, the baths are ready. Tori yelled from a window. Bring Inari with you. Izuku, Momo told me to tell you we are kidnapping your daughter for a bit. Okay, he yelled back. Itsuka laughed, you are not going to argue about it. Are you nuts? He said, the six of them would murder me. Mina brought Inari over to give Itsuka hugs and kisses before Mina disappeared into the dorms with her. Itsuka hugged Izuku before she left to go to her dorms. Ijira walked over to Izuku. Hey man, us guys were going to have Ultimate Hero Brawl Smackdown 8 tournament. Hang out, eat some chips, drink some soda, you want to join us. Yay, that sound like a lot of fun, Izuku responded. Feel me, I look forward to establishing my dominance over you fools. He said, smirking. Izuku, 
Having never experienced a group of guys playing video games before, the level of shit-talking that was reached had him double over laughing. Even better was that Bakugo had gotten roped into playing as well. When Izuku trounced him in the first round, he immediately blamed the controller, stomped off to his room, and returned the UHBS-8 fighting stick, which prompted other boys to dash off for theirs. Ajiro stood on the edges of the group for a little bit before he retreated upstairs. His surprise winner Tenya Ida went undefeated with a massive grin on his face with every victory. It was a great night. He didn't even mind the mess afterward. Hinari. Hinari Midori was having the time of her life in the large girl's bath. She had managed to patiently sit through Momo washing her hair and body and rinsing her off before, with a nod from Momo, she found herself in the bath. All the girls played with her and gave her all the attention she wanted. Then the bath ended, and they all sat in Momo's room with coloring books. They put ribbons in her hair, watched cartoons, and tickled her. She didn't want the night to end, even when her dad showed up. Eventually, she had to say goodnight, but she got kisses from all of them before doing so. She even tried to get Daddy to give them kisses goodnight. But for some reason, Daddy and the girls' faces got red, and Daddy just told them all goodnight and took her downstairs to their room. Her daddy was funny like that. Izuku. Having gotten Inari to bed and completed his evening rounds of the dorm, he stood at the sink dressed in just a pair of basketball shorts, drinking a glass of water when there was a knock at the door. Without thinking, he walked over and opened it, standing there was Ojiro. Can I help you? There is a clog in my bathroom, he said quietly, looking down. I would take care of it myself, but the tools are locked up, I saw your light still on. Izuku grabbed his keys and walked to the maintenance room, he quickly grabbed his toolbox. Lead the way, he said. The two walked in silence up the stairs to Ajiro's room. Izuku went straight to the bathroom, and sure enough, the sink was clogged. He opened the cabinet and went to work. The silence was deafening. Ajiro, I don't want to have a problem with you the entire three years we are here. I would like to find a way to work past this and at least be cordial to each other, Izuku said from beneath the sink. I crossed a line, big time. I shouldn't have said anything about your daughter. He replied. You are right about that, Izuku said. I don't care if you have a problem with me, though I don't understand why. I don't care if you have a problem with Itsuka, she is a big girl and can take care of herself, but my daughter is off limits. Yeah, man, I get that. I fucked up big time. He said quietly. Look, Ajiro, for some fucked up reason, you seem to have this notion that I sabotaged your relationship with Itsuka. I didn't even know about your relationship with her until after Inari's mom died, she came home. I told her that what she did was fucked up. I want to figure out a way past this. We are training to be heroes, and I need to know I can trust you to have my back. We don't have to be friends or anything, but we do have to be able to trust each other. When she left me, it seemed like she was running to you, and since I already was blaming you, it was easy just to be. A dick, Izuku supplied. When I reached out to her, I wanted her to come back for the funeral, meet Inari, and maybe provide me some emotional support. You don't understand, he said, his voice cracking. All I ever heard was Izuku this or Izuku that. If we were together, she would break off whatever we did to talk to you. Was it the same when Suijin called? He said, if she had told me she was on a date, I would have teased her and told her to call me after she was done playing tonsil hockey. Ajiro didn't respond as Izuku got to his feet and tested the sink to ensure it was clear. She didn't love me. He said, that's true, Izuku said. I don't know what that is like, but I know what it is like to have the person you love most in this world taken from you. Ajiro, you have friends and family. When Suijin died, I had no one I could reach out to other than Itsuka. I would have done the same even if I knew about you because Itsuka is my best friend, and she was Suijin's best friend. How can I know that? He protested. Izuku sighed and took a deep breath. I am only going to say this once, I didn't know you existed before she told me, and honestly, I would not have cared in the fucking slightest. As long as you made her happy, she deserves happiness would be my only concern. I could have walked in on the two of you having sex, and all I would have said would lock the damn door next time. We don't have to be friends. We have to work together. If you come at me or my daughter again, I will beat your ass. If the battle trial wasn't enough and you want to fight, I have a faculty pass. We can go to the sparing ground and settle this right now. It is your decision. Ajiro stared at him, his hands clenched. I loved her, man, and she didn't love me back. His eyes never left Izuku. I don't want to be your friend, I don't like you. But we can be colleagues, I apologize for saying that about your daughter. Whether I like it or not, we are stuck together for the next three years, and we must learn to work together. Izuku walked out of the room and headed downstairs when he saw a light in the kitchen and went to check it out. He saw a wild Mina shaking her butt as she was digging around in the fridge. I don't think you're ready for this jelly. I don't think you are ready for this. Cause my body too bootalicious for you, babe. Now bear in mind that as she was doing this, she was in short sleep shorts. As she stood up from the fridge, her tank top was sheer, and there was no bra. Mina hadn't noticed him yet as she focused on a piece of chocolate cake. Izuku felt his body respond, seeing this display in front of him. It was fucking sexy as hell. I don't know what that song is, but I love it. Holy hell, I should probably dip, oh fuck she spotted me. He thought. Mina looked up as she retrieved a fork and saw Izuku standing there with an eep. She jumped back, her hand over her heart. Everything jiggled in all the right places, Izuku noticed. What the fuck do I do? 
So I was curious, what did you get for that word problem on the math homework tonight? He said, trying to be casual and thanking God that the counter hit his waist. I am a fucking moron. I don't remember, she said, confused. But I do have to wonder if you are dressed like that just for little Olmi. She purred as she let her eyes dance over his bare chest, admiring the muscle. Then, Izuku realized he was standing there with no shirt and a pair of basketball shorts. He blushed, trying desperately to come up with a response. I just had to go unclog a drain, and my shirt got wet, so I took it off, but I can say the same thing about you. He said, leaning forward, hoping to God that he didn't sound as dumb as he thought he did. It was then that Mina realized what she was wearing and that her breasts were practically showing due to the sheerness of her shirt. Her cheeks went purple before she picked up her cake and left the kitchen. Night, she called over her shoulder as she disappeared up the stairs. Once he was sure he was alone, he leaned his head against the counter, sweet lord and baby Jesus. His heart was pounding almost out of his chest, he quickly put the toolbox away and went to his room. He couldn't get the image out of his head as he drifted off to sleep though it wasn't Mina dancing in front of the fridge. Instead, he was a black-haired heiress, and it would not leave his mind so quickly. Aizawa showed Aizawa's life had not been going well. He was darn well falling apart ever since the first day of term. His whole class mutinied against him and decided to walk out, which was okay with him. He had also expelled the previous year's one on the first day. It was slightly bothersome because some of the students had some potential. He may have only expelled five minutes seven of them on the first day. Then that damn rat fired him, handing the class to midnight. He knew she wouldn't get rid of everyone till probably the second year. She would waste time on those with no talent and not dedicated, taking time from those that could make it. Those that survived their time with him had the highest survival rate of their first two years of being pro heroes. He was saving these kids' lives, wasn't he? He found himself on patrol for two nights after being fired. Yes, he could admit that he may have been a little rougher bringing some people in, but he was not a robot, he had emotions. Well, sympathy and compassion were not his strongest, wrath on the other hand. He knew that one rather well till that night. He had encountered a small-time drug dealer, nothing too major, but he let the buyer leave and decided to follow the dealers to see if they could lead him to something bigger. And they did, just not in the way Aizawa could have hoped. Once he found their little hub and manufacturing center, it was simple to bust in an arrest, easy, job well done. The dealers put up a fight but were relatively quickly dealt with, one had managed to escape the initial scuffle. He had chased him down farther into the facility and found him trying to get an addict off the couch to escape. When he burst in and captured the male, the female's voice caught his attention. Hey, Mr. Aizawa, is that you? Her voice sliced through the air like a knife, slurred and sinks on the result of her noticeable high. The boy struggling in his capture scarf immediately stopped struggling. Mr. Aizawa, who are you too? Shota was not used to hearing his name tossed around by villains and drug addicts. Erase her head, sure, but Mr. Aizawa, that would be a big bad no. The girl stumbled forward, Mr. Aizawa, it's me, Katie. Don't you remember me? The girl was a mess, in short, gray gym shorts and a red tattered tank top. Aizawa looked at the girl with dawning recognition before looking at the not struggling boy as recognition settled in again. They were Katie and Kato's, twin brother and sister from last year's class. The girl could command water but had little actual control, and the boy could manipulate air but was very weak. While pursuing the young man, Aizawa noticed that he had used his air blast to blast open doors, knock stack boxes over, and perform other feats. Aizawa clapped the quirk-suppressing cuffs on the boy and turned his attention to Katie, who was in a drugged-induced haze. The police took Kato to the station for processing as Aizawa sat with Katie, who was receiving medical attention. Katie, what happened? He asked. The girl had just flopped over, and her eyes locked on his, you did. What do you mean? He said confused. We worked hard to get into UA. And then you kicked us out the first day. We could barely get any other hero school to look at us. She giggled and smacked her lips. Can I get some water? Aizawa looked at the EMT, who nodded. Aizawa handed the girl a bottle of water he had to help her take a drink. None of them wanted to touch us. We got kicked out on day one. Our quirks weren't powerful, so there wasn't a lot for us. You remember Amber? Aizawa nodded that she was another girl from the expelled class. She was down, and she is the one who gave me Fantasia for the first time. It is so great, I don't care anymore. She waved her hand in front of her face like there was more to see than the simple act. Kato takes care of me, he is such a good brother. She smiled broadly and laughed at something that wasn't there. Where is Amber? Aizawa asked wondering if she was still in the facility. She's dead, she giggled again, her parents kicked her out, she started hooking, and one of her johns killed her. Poor Amber, I miss her sometimes. Katie was smiling and laughing as they loaded her into the ambulance. Aizawa could hear the laughter as the doors closed and they drove away. Aizawa went to the police station and walked into Kato's interrogation chamber. Mr. Aizawa, his voice dripped with venom. Well, I guess you were right, Katie, and I had no potential. Aizawa looked at the boy, I said you had no potential for heroics. Why didn't you pursue something else? We wanted to be heroes, you sack of shit. We trained to be heroes. We dreamed of being heroes. We studied to be heroes. What is your drugged-induced mind thinks that translates to something else? Do you know what our parents did to us when we came home at 10 a.m. and had to tell them that we had been expelled? Do you know that tuition is not fully refundable? They only give you back 50%. 
Katie was devastated. Then she got hooked on Fantasia, and Amber's parents kicked her out. You know that one of the other guys you arrested tonight was in your glass two years before me. You expelled him on day two. You two could have applied. He started to say. To where? What other hero school wants two twins who got expelled from UA? On the first day. Hey mom and dad, I know you just shelled out a fortune for me and my sister to go to UA. We got kicked out. Can you do that again so we can attend this other hero school? Oh, by the way, it is far away, and you must pay for us to have a dorm, and we are not allowed to work to subsidize this at all. He yelled, his voice ripe with anger. You know that out of the twenty of us, only four got into another hero course. Three got into general education, and five are dead. Ken killed himself that night, you son of a bitch. Aizawa stared at the young man. Now I am going to jail. Katie will be released from the hospital in seventy-two hours and be on the street. I hope she doesn't end up like Amber, but she was already that way before I started supplying her. I made my choices, and I get that, this is my fault. I want you to look at me, and I promise you will see me again when I get out. Remember to send flowers to Katie's funeral for me. I got nothing else to say to you, get the fuck out of here. Kado, get out, get the fuck out. Aizawa stepped out, and he could hear Kado screaming until the door closed. He started walking down the hall, pulling out his phone, a sleepy famous radio host answered on the other end. Shota, is everything okay? It's 2 a.m. Hizashi, I need a favor. His voice was desperate. Sure, Shota, sure, what do you need? Hizashi knew something was going on. I need you to get me the name of every student I have expelled. Why do you need that? Please, he's a... Present Mike knew something was wrong. Shota hardly said please and only called him he's a when drunk. Okay, Shota, do you need it now? As soon as possible. He replied and hung up the phone. He raced to the hospital, going to check on Katie. He found her still drugged out in a room with other people in a similar state. When she saw him, she started laughing. He walked over to her. Katie, I want to get you to help. Will you let me help you? He asked a hint of pleading in his voice. A look of sobriety washed over Katie momentarily before she spat on him. Get out, you ruined our lives, and now you want to play hero. I didn't need you to be a hero, I needed you to be a teacher. Get out, get the hell out. Soon everyone in the room started shouting the same thing. Aizawa was stunned into silence, a nurse pulled him out of the room. Aizawa returned to the agency to fill out the paperwork in a daze. He didn't even acknowledge Ms. Joke when she passed him in the hall. When he got home, he found a box on the coffee table inside his home. Only Hazashi and Nimori had a key to his place. He walked over, retrieved his laptop from his bedroom, sat with the box he opened, pulled the first file, and ran it into the system. Three days later, Nimori and Hazashi found Aizawa sitting in a darkened room, papers were thrown everywhere. He was drunk, and empty bottles of whiskey were everywhere. He looked at his friends with a haunted look. I killed them, I killed so many of them. I thought I was saving them, but instead, I killed them. Hazashi said nothing but walked over and lifted his friend by the arm. Shit, Shota, you need a bath, come on. He dragged his friend down the hall, Nimiri turned on the lights and opened a window to air out the place some. She started picking up the papers before she picked up a legal tablet that was crumpled and tear-stained. She started reading down the list of names. Next to the names was a year, and next to that were words like incarcerated, dead, suicide, drugs, alcoholic, and vigilante. Only a few said married and happy, and even a fewer numbers said hero. Friday morning may not have been perfect, but it sure as heck was slightly awkward. Izuku was having difficulty looking at Momo without his mind running rampant with the thoughts that had plagued him the night before. Momo was suffering the same that darn dream wouldn't fade. Little did they know that tonight would not only make today's awkwardness seem like normalcy, but nothing would ever be the same again after tonight. But that was tonight. This is the morning. Inari was strangely muted this morning, as if the little girl was contemplating the mysteries of the universe and had decided that it was more than her little mind could comprehend or that she was solving the problem of everything and couldn't be bothered with much else. She was checked for fever or illness by all involved. Surprisingly, the winner of her affection was Toru, Inari hugged her and didn't want to let go. So much so that Izuku had to ask Toru if she would be willing to walk with him to drop her off at daycare. Itsuka hid her pout of not going by the coffee cart well, but Momo noticed. Of course, she noticed she had been thinking about Itsuka quite a bit over the past day. Itsuka, would you like to head out with me? I heard of this coffee cart I would like to visit, Momo said. Itsuka perked up and nodded, grabbing her bag and following the heiress out the door. How did Momo know of the coffee cart? Izuku had walked into class with a cup, prompting a conversation. He mentioned taking Itsuka there as a thank you for walking with Inari. The duo walked out, Momo kept the conversation light until they were well away from the dorms. Momo had never had a conversation close to this and was hesitant to begin. Itsuka. Itsuka could hear the trepidation in Momo's voice. What's up? Momo. I know this may sound a bit odd, and you don't have to respond in kind, but I don't know exactly how to say this. Oh my god, is she about to confess? I'm flattered. She is gorgeous, sweet, smart. Wait what? I wanted to say that I think of you as my best friend. Hedeska was relieved, confused but relieved. I know you may not feel the same, but I have known you for as long as Izuku. 
and that is the longest I have known anybody outside of house staff, but I don't think that counts. Itsuka thought about it, and she was close to Momo more so than anyone else, especially after. It pained her for a moment, but she realized she wasn't trying to replace Suijin with anyone. Momo, after all, was very different. I agree with you, Momo, you are also my best friend. That made Momo's heart flutter for some reason, giving the heiress pause. I was wondering, since Izuku has plans on set if you wanted to hang out, maybe we could go get our hair done and maybe a manicure. Itsuka looked at Momo, and the heiress looked cute, fidgeting with her hands and rocking her shoulders. To any on the outside, it would look like some confession. I would love to, Itsuka said, and Momo lit up like she had won a fantastic prize. I will make all the arrangements, and we can talk more after school today, Momo said. The heiress was beaming as they ordered their coffee and headed to class. Izuku and Toru. Thank you again, Toru, Izuku said as they walked to the daycare. I don't know what's gotten into her this morning. It's okay, Izuku, Toru replied, he could detect happiness in her voice. Inari is adorable, and snuggling this little thing is a good way to start my morning. You okay, little one? Inari nodded slightly, as she just had her head on Toru's shoulder as they walked. As they got closer to the daycare, they heard a girl squeal. They both turned and saw a girl with straight black hair and black eyes but a blue sclear, it made them look like they were floating in an ocean. Her alabaster white skin added to the girl's beauty. I am so sorry, but is that your little sister? The girl said, pointing to Inari. Toru noticed that the girl had approached on the side closest to Inari, but Inari immediately switched to the opposite shoulder and turned her head away. Inari clung tighter to Toru. The invisible girl immediately started rubbing Inari's back and whispering. Izuku stepped forward. No, she is my daughter, and this is my friend Toru. She is helping me take her to daycare. She is so sweet, the girl said, dripping with sweetness. Wait, your daughter. Are you the mother? Toru said no and moved to position Izuku between herself and the new girl. She noticed that Inari relaxed slightly. Her mother passed away close to a year ago, I'm sorry you are. Oh, how silly of me, she said lightly, tapping her head, I just saw her, and she is so darn adorable that I acted without thinking, Ren Ishida, first year business course. She bowed. Are you in the hero course? Yes, we both are, he said. I would love to sit with you and talk about the whole dad hero thing, Ren said smiling. We have to put together a marketing campaign for a new hero, and I think the challenge of presenting you would be interesting. Izuku noticed her eyes wandered over him all very briefly. Her is my contact info, she said as she pulled out a piece of paper and handed it to him. Call me if you are interested. Toodles, she called as she spun her fingers, waving in the air as she skipped the lane. She was very odd, Izuku muttered, putting the paper in his pocket. I don't think Inari liked her very much, Toru said as Izuku turned towards them. She seemed upset or something. We should get her to daycare. Once they arrived, Inari immediately looked around and seemed to brighten up some, slowly leaning over till she found what she thought was Toru's cheek and kissed it, Toru giggled, telling her good job. Inari kissed her dad before transferring to Mrs. Himero, the little girl seemed to relax. Izuku told the teacher that Inari was acting odd this morning to let him know if anything popped up. Inari didn't even give her traditional bye, by only waving her little hand at the two before disappearing with the teacher into the back. Maybe I should schedule an appointment with Recovery Girl. Nothing seems wrong, but that might not be a bad idea, just in case, Toru said. Joint training. The morning passed quickly, and lunch was an excitable affair as the joint heroics class was just afterward. Itsuka changed and stepped out onto the training grounds, looking for Izuku. She spotted him talking with Momo and Achako. She froze momentarily, looking at the two girls in their costumes. Achako had a much better figure than Itsuka realized, and Momo, holy hell, Momo was stunning. Itsuka shook her head, confused about why she even thought that and started walking over. Any dour mood or intrusive thoughts vanished when Izuku turned around and saw him look her over. It gave her goosebumps, and that plush smile banished everything else away. Itsuka, it looks amazing, he gushed, walking over to her. You look so cool, and not to mention pretty. She blushed at the compliment but returned his smile, you look great, too, I like the darker green. Before he could respond, Momo and Achako came over to compliment her, and soon, the rest of their group was arriving. The girls noticed that Mina just smiled and blushed before moving away as Izuku waved and looked away himself. Before anyone could comment, their homeroom teachers emerged. One to the right, one B to the left, line it up. Vlad yelled out, Yes, S-E-N-S-E-I. The students responded, Step forward, introduce yourself, he yelled. You the step forward for one a fist, for one B. The first to stand was a boy, 5'8", with black hair and gray eyes. Hello, my name is Yostu Awais, and my quirk is called Weld, I confuse things at an atomic level. Next was another boy about the same height with dark brown hair and black eyes. Sen Kaibara, gyrate is my quirk, I can make any part of my body rotate at high speeds. Nina stepped up, followed by Tsu. A tall boy, 6'2", has green skin, green hair, and eyes. Tagaru Kamakiri, razor sharp, I make blades. Tenya bowed and made his introduction, the Bakugo stepped up, simply saying his name and quirk. A young man with all black skin and white hair stepped forward, a little taller than the first two. Shihai Kiruwaro, I call my quirk black. I can merge with anything dark. Itsuka stepped forward and introduced herself. 
most already had an idea of who was already. She noticed that Bakugo gave her a bit of a side eye due to their history and more so from her association with Izuku, but the explosive blonde said nothing. Yuikote surprisingly stepped forward first. She was average height, 5'3", with black hair and cerulean eyes. In an emotionless voice, she pulled an item from her belt, and to one a surprise, it suddenly grew into a 55-gallon metal drum. Then she pressed her fingertips together, and it shook back down. Yui Kodai, Quirk's eyes. How cool she deactivated her quirk like me, Hachako said with a smile. Yui just nodded in response once. Oh, sorry, Hachako said, blushing as she introduced herself. Next, the girl could almost be mistaken for Hachako's sister due to her hair color and height. Um, hey hello, my name is Kanoko Komori, Shroom, and my quirk is Mushrooms. I can make them, and I like them Shroom. Okay, bye. The shy girl went and stood behind next to Itsuka. Ajiro followed Kanoko in introducing himself. He tried to get Kanoko to acknowledge him, at least to no avail. Ibarra Shinazaki stepped up, tossing her vine-like hair over her shoulder, her dark green eyes looking over the students from 1A. She was tall, 5'6". Hello, I am Ibarra Shinazaki, and the Lord has seen fit to grant me the gift of vines. I can lengthen and manipulate the vines on my head to the good work God has called me to do. She clasped her hand in front of her and bowed her head. May the Lord's blessing fall upon us this day. May we absorb all the wisdom that our senseis will impart upon us, and may our hearts and minds remain pure. Amen. Cool, cool. Yo, Shep 1B, Denki said as he introduced himself. Next, the boy covered in brown fur. Hair. Step forward. Greeting 1A, I am Juro to Shishida, and I call my quirk beast. When I activate it, I increase all my physical attributes. I look forward to us working together during this training exercise. Izuku noticed the boy staring at him. Izuku was slightly confused and even looked behind himself to see if someone was behind him. Momo giggled a little at the look on Izuku's face before she introduced herself 1B. I, Nido Monoma, a 5'7 blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy said as he walked forward with a smug smile. My quirk is quite versatile and will be the envy of all. I call it copy. It allows me to copy your quirks and show you how to use them properly, except for you, Ms. Yairazu. I am sure there is nothing I could teach you. He finished with a bow as his eyes danced over Momo and Achako's figures. The girls gave an internal shudder. The boys wanted to punch him in his smug face. Ajiro rolled his eyes before giving a brief hello and explanation of his quirk. A heavy set boy with light blue hair and black eyes stepped forward. Hello. Nyernjiki Shoda, my quirk is twin impact. I can strike a target and trigger a stronger secondary impact at the point of contact. Rikido Sato, the pretty blonde American girl with large blue eyes and a pleasant smile stepped up. Me, pony, sorry, my Japanese is not good. Quirk horns, they fly I can control. Mizo stepped up. He bowed as he introduced himself and his quirk before stepping back in line. A boy with spiky brown hair and black eyes stepped forward with a smile. Sup, all my quirk is solid air, pretty self-explanatory. I hope we have a great training experience today. Oh, Kosai Tsuburaba, he said, pointing to himself. Nice, I'm Hantasiro. Tetsu 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 Tetsu. A guy with silver hair, crazy blonde eyebrows, and black eyes stepped up. Hey 1A, yes, that is my name, it's so great that you say it four times. You can call me Tetsu, my quirk is steel. I can turn my skin to steel. Kayoka stepped up and laughed, so metal, am I right? Cricket's tough room, that's what I get, I guess. Setsuna Takage, a pretty girl with dark green hair, eyes, and sharp teeth, stepped up and smiled. What's up all? Call me Set, my quirk is lizard tail splitter. I can split my body into pieces and control them with my mind. Shoto did a bare minimum intro before stepping back in line. The final grouping of students traded their intro with Class 1A's Fumikage, Tor, Koji, Minta, and finally Izuku doing their introductions. Manga stepped up and, with his bubble showing a waving hand and smiley face, demonstrated his quirk by making the bubble for a pop, they all heard it. The blonde with gaunt features and ash blonde hair introduced himself as Juzo Honuki and explained his quirk of softening. A tall lad with what looked like a glue dispenser for a head stepped forward and, with what could be called a voice so deep that Barry White would have been impressed, introduced himself as Kajiro Bondo and explained his quirk Semidine. The last girl from Wana stepped forward and introduced herself as Ryaiko Yanagi and said that her quirk was a poltergeist. Her Rin gave the final introduction with his quirk of scales. Outstanding students, now we are going to break into groups for our 4v4 fights. When you are called, go to the number arena circle and wait for further instructions, Midnight said. Team D versus Team H. Team D, Hizuku, Minta, Ibarra, Itsuka. Team H, Nito, Jirota, Bakugo, Fumikage. Team D, ugh, why does it have to be an all-boys team? At least we got some eye candy on our side. Minta lisped out, looking over at Ibarra and Itsuka. Izuku sighed. Excuse him, please. My name is Izuku, he said, attempting to introduce himself to Ibarra. Yes, you are the father of Inari. She responded. Before this battle, will you answer me a question? If I can. He said, her mother, Suijin, Itsuka, said you plan to marry. Is that true? She said, her voice measured. Yes, our plan was once I graduated UA. To get married, she wanted to work with children. He said, 
While the actions that have brought Inari into the world are against my beliefs, I feel that all that has transpired is the will of God. Itsuka and your daughter speak highly of you and your deeds as her father. I may have judged you without knowing everything, and for that, I apologize, but I will be watching you to ensure that the path you walk is righteous, if for nothing else, for the sake of Inari. She bowed and stepped back. Izuku was confused, Itsuka told him she would explain later. Now we need to devise some plan. She said, doesn't matter anyway. Not like we could win, Minta said. Izuku rubbed his eyes. Minta, why do you want to be a hero? Why the girls, of course. He said, winking at Ibarra and Itsuka. That's it, just the girls. Yup. He replied, popping the pea. Minta looked around at the other groups, checking out the girls in 1A and 1B. Izuku and Itsuka began to formulate a plan. Ibarra pointed out a few things, and Minta added, yeah, sure. At the sound of the gong, ice immediately erupted from Nito, freezing Ibarra. Bakugo and Jurota immediately dashed at Izuku, and Dark Shadow raced at Itsuka. Minta just stepped back out of the ring. I am going to rip you limb from limb, growled Jurota, his quirk activating. Bakugo came flying over the top, I got you to no D.E.K.U. I don't know what your problem is, Jurota, and come get it, Bakugo. He fired back as lightning erupted around his body, a green glow quickly formed around Bakugo's gauntlets and yanked him down, forcing him to collide with Jurota. Itsuka, can you get big and hairy off of me, he yelled. Sure, you take the shadow, she replied as she connected with the quirk, driving it back some. We need to free Ibarra, what quirk did he copy? Shoto's, Izuku replied as he shattered Ibarra's prison through a blast of compressed air. He smiled as the technique worked. Though his finger was in pain, it wasn't broken. Jirota grunted from the impact of Bakugo and went to swipe at the explosion user. Same side, you dumb beast, he yelled out. Before Jirota could respond, Itsuka came in from the side with a supersized Superman, sending Jirota tumbling. Fucking whore, he growled, spitting blood onto the mat. Whore, she yelled back, are you and Ajiro drinking that same fucking Kool-Aid? You know what, I don't fucking care, Jirota. Let's fucking do this, she roared. Where is that damn pervert? Ibarra yelled. He ditched us, I need you to try and hold Nito off for a minute, Izuku yelled as he ducked under Dark Shadow's attack. Before he could do anything further, Bakugo came crashing down, landing a kick to his back and sending him sprawling. Stay out of my way Tweety, I got this. He yelled. You ain't got shit, Izuku said, fuck this maximum effort, 50%. His body cried out in protest, he pushed off in a blur and speared Bakugo, sending them crashing into Dark Shadow in a mess of limbs. When Bakuo went to fire another blast, he yanked his gauntlets violently to the side, causing the explosion to hit Dark Shadow. The quirk returned as Izuku spun, grabbed Bakugo by his ankles, and threw him at Nito. Ibarra had barely blocked another ice attack and was panting heavily, target Fumi, she heard Izuku yell. Quickly, she located the boy and sent her vines racing at him. Dark Shadow went to intercept, but Izuku tackled him, calling up one for all even higher, forcing the lightning to re-emerge, causing Dark Shadow to wince, but did not stop the bird from landing a vicious body blow that sent Izuku flying off. Jirota came at Itsuka, his mind quickly fading as he pushed his quirk farther in rage. Itsuka realized what was happening as her one-time friend attacks came at her more clumsily but with much greater power than she had ever seen him put forth. When he sent her flying back after a brutal backhand, she skidded to a stop near the arena's edge. She spits out a mouthful of blood. What's the matter? You made that I dumped Ajiro for a real man, one that looked at me like a woman. Jirota mindlessly charged as Itsuka smiled. She raced to meet him, and as he neared, she slid down on her knees underneath her much larger foe, enlarging her hands at the last possible second, she grabbed his ankles, causing him to crash down face first. Quickly, she spun and took his back, slipping to the side and driving her knee into his rib cage repeatedly. She was greeted with the satisfactory sound of them breaking and his scream of pain when he blindly went to try and bat her away she trapped his arm against her body. Taking a hold of hit with both hands, she activated her quirk again and snapped it. Not done yet, she scrambled to take his back. After driving his head back into the ground with an elbow, she slipped her arms around his massive neck and squeezed. He tried desperately to reach her, but his arms just didn't reach due to his increased size. Itsuka tightened the choke, feeling him ebb. I get to be with who I want when I want, you son of a bitch. Ibarra saw Dark Shadow break free and race towards her. She braced for impact as her veins were almost at fumigage. When the Shadow Quirk roared, rearing back its mighty fist, she sent out a silent prayer. She felt an arm slip around her waist and twirl her aside. Izuku was there. He reared back and threw a heinous straight left, Detroit, smash. He yelled as their fist collided. Bakugo scrambled up off of Nayato, who was cursing at him. Seeing the Dark Shadow and Izuku's fists collide, he snarled at Izuku. Dark Shadow was thrown back, as was Izuku, who barely managed to avoid leaving the ring when Ibarra Vines grabbed Fumikage and threw him out. Bakugo shoved Nito as he charged in directly to Izuku. He was in mid-flight and didn't even see the giant fist that came crashing into the side of his head. Did you forget about me, you motherfucker? Cause I didn't forget about you, Itsuku yelled. I got this takeout, Nito. Izuku looked at Ibarra, sweat was pouring off him. You got my back. She gulped, yes. The feeling of his arm around her waist lingered. Behind you. A voice yelled in his mind. 
Izuku yanked Ibarra to him and jumped into the air, activating float as a spike ice wave raced past them. Ibarra was wide-eyed as she was pressed against his muscular chest. Wait, he can fucking fly, why didn't you two say anything about that? Nito yelled, his face contorting in anger. It's more floating in style, Izuku said back. Ibarra, can you throw me and get yourself down safely? With pleasure, Izuku Midoriya, she smiled, her vines wrapping around his waist. Others shot out, keeping her off the ground as she twirled and hurled him like a bullet at Nito. The blonde face blanched as he dropped Shoto's quirk and quickly activated Tetsu's. There is nothing you can do now, you fool, I am the greatest alive, the glory of one bee shall forever. He never finished that sentence, Manchester smash. He roared as one for all sprang to life, filling his arm to 100%. The impact sounded with a massive clang that stopped all the other fights as Nito's face contorted around Izuku's fist, and he rocketed out of the ring, smashing into the far wall. Bakugo landed, eating another fist to the face. He fired an explosion to back her off slightly, allowing him to plant his hand and pivot, landing a solid kick to her midsection. I didn't forget about you, you just aren't worth my attention, you're that other bitch. Bad move, motherfucker. Itsuka sneered and re-engaged. When he attempted to fire off his explosion to gain altitude, his legs were suddenly wrapped in vines that forcefully yanked him back to the ground as he fell. Itsuka smirked, jumping and doing a bicycle kick, connecting squarely with his solar plexus, driving all wind from his body. He landed with such force that he bounced. Itsuka retook the air, landing an enormous double axe handle smash anyone had ever seen. This time, he didn't jump, he was forced to the ground. She landed next to him, yanked his bloodied face up, and saw he was still conscious. She delivered a straight right ending that. I'm sorry, what were you saying? She said, can't hear you. Team H has been eliminated. Vlad Sensei called out. Get the medical staff over there. Izuku, his arm broken, held his hand towards the girls as he stalked out of the arena and found Mindo watching Momo's match. It just had to include Achako and two girls from 1B. He snatched Mindo up by his cape. Where the hell were you? He yelled. I walked off, we weren't going to win, so why bother, Mina said with a shrug, not even looking but leering at Pony as she and Archako were entangled on the ground. Jesus, Mina, do you have a heroic bone in your body, Izuku yelled. In case you didn't hear, we did win. Yeah, and you have a broken arm for it, Mina sighed. Look, Midoriya, what is the point of fighting a fight you cannot win? Just walk away. Or I know you like music, slip out the back before they know you were there, at the most, you will see nobody cares. What? Izuku said, confused. It's a song, check it out, Mina said, straightening his cape as Izuku set him down. Look, man, I used to try and run in and do the heroic thing, and I just got my ass kicked for my trouble. No one cared, not even whomever I was trying to help, no one. Then I saw the guys that got the girls so that I would hang with them. Once you agree with them, they stop beating you up. I am not brave like you or the others. I am here to become a hero, save a few girls, and live the good life. 20 seconds, Minta, Midoriya said. Huh, something I read. Sometimes, all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. And if you can do that, you can be a hero. He said, the pain was finally overriding the adrenaline. Mr. M-I-D-O-R-I-Y-A Midnight yelled. I don't know what you think being a hero is, but if you don't pull your head out of your ass, you will get someone else killed, because they depended on you. You will get innocent people killed, not to mention yourself. He stumbled as Itsuka and Ibarra caught him. He smiled at them, offering his thanks as Midnight approached, wanting to know what had happened with Minta. When he told her, Minta was sent to the locker room to change and wait in the classroom. You need to get to the recovery girl, young man. Midnight said, can you ladies help him there? Yes, sensei, they responded. Itsuka. She sat there gazing at the sleeping Izuku. Recovery girl had chastised the boy, but he fell asleep after a quick kiss on his forehead. Recovery girl smiled and told Itsuka he would be fine and wake up in a few hours. She was still in her costume, checking to make sure they were alone, when she leaned down and lightly kissed his lips. She wanted it to be nothing, for it to be like any other kiss, to put aside this fantasy that had plagued her for years. She was wrong. It was electric, she felt it in her heart, everywhere. He hadn't even kissed her back, and she swooned. Tears at the corners of her eyes, she whispered, I am in love with you, Izuku Midoriya. Love you too, he whispered back. She jumped back, her heart pounding, one hand over her chest, the other touching her lips. He doesn't mean it, not like that. There is no way he does dot 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 but what if? Itsuka fled the infirmary. That night, minus 1B dorms. Itsuka was in the kitchen with Set and Kanoko as they worked on dinner for the class. Jiroda had said nothing once they returned to class or at all. Mito had just sneered at her in pure hatred as he stalked off. You seem to be making friends, Set teased. I don't know what everyone's problem is, Itsuka sighed. They seemed overly concerned with my love life. We haven't been in school long enough for anyone to start hitting on each other, so you get to provide that drama, Set replied. That is some bullshit, Itsuka said, setting the salads on the counter. Luckily, it only seems to be those two grasping onto it now, Shroom, Kanoko said. The rest of the class has pulled their heads out of their asses. I want Jiroda and Ajiro to get their shit together. That would be nice, Itsuka added. Now, what the hell is Nito's problem? Your boyfriend hit him too hard, Set smirked. Speaking of which, aren't you going over there tonight? 
No, not tonight. I want to relax, she said, hiding her blush. She could not see him right now after the infirmary, she didn't trust herself. And he is not my boyfriend. Not with that attitude, Set said. We girls were going to watch some movies tonight, we reserved the big TV. Do you want to join us? Kinoko asked hopefully. I would, Kinoko, that sounds like fun. Izuku and Momo. Izuku was released from the infirmary, and after some gummies, he felt pretty good. As he arrived at the daycare, when Inari saw him, whatever had been plaguing her this morning seemed to be gone. His daughter called his name and barreled into his arms. Momo was happy when Izuku and Inari walked in, and the little girl squirmed out of Izuku's arms and ran over to her. This was where life decided that complication was the game's name. As Momo squatted down to catch the adorable little missile, Inari called Mama. Momo froze as did Izuku. Thankfully, the common room was empty. Momo got her bearings as Inari jumped into her arms. Momo was sure she had heard the little girl wrong or that it was a slip of the tongue. Momo, Mama are very close together. Then she repeated it. Mama, kisses, Mama. Momo felt her heart swell, hearing those words from Inari. She smiled and gave the girl her kisses, Inari giggled. It's Momo, the heiress said gently. Mama, Inari said. Momo, she corrected. No, Mama, Inari said, sounding heartbroken, tears leaking out the corners of her eyes. Mama, Momo said, keeping her tears back, and hugged the little girl close. Izuku was frozen, he didn't know what to do. Part of him wanted to correct Inari, but when Momo tried hearing the pain in his daughter's voice, he didn't know what to do. Then there was the image of Momo holding Inari, it stirred emotions inside him and was beautiful. When he thought about it, no one else could be in that position but one, Itsuka. As the thought danced across his mind, he quickly banished it. She was his best friend, and it wasn't right to think like that. Will you eat dinner with us, Mama? Inari said. Can Mama eat dinner with us, Daddy? If she wants to, Izuku said quietly, not trusting his voice. I would love to eat dinner with you, my darling, Momo said quickly, wiping a tear. They entered his quarters as Inari pulled Momo over to the television. The little girl turned on the TV and climbed onto Momo's lap, pulling the heiress arms around her. What do you want to watch? Momo asked, looking down as Inari tilted her head back to look up at Momo. The image would forever be burned into Izuku's memory, his daughter looking up at Momo and the loving expression on both faces. Genie, she said proudly. Momo nodded and got it playing as the two just sat there watching the movie together. Izuku forced himself to ready dinner instead of gawking at the scene on the couch. His insides were panicking as he was trying to process everything. There was no doubt about it, he had feelings for Momo. Inari calling her mama was a nail in the coffin. Obviously, Momo cared for his daughter, but how did she feel about him? He didn't want to push the issue and drive Momo away, especially with the revelation from Inari. Izuku made a dinner of yakizakana, miso soup, rice, and salad. He managed to time it as the move ended to avoid interrupting two bonding. When they sat to eat, Momo put Inari in her high chair and, like a mother, got Inari her apple juice and set about making sure Inari was eating before she did so herself. Momo and Izuku avoided addressing the elephant in the room. Instead, she reminded him of the little he missed after the heroic class. He instead focused on her fight, having her recant what had happened in the bout. After dinner, once the dishes were in the dishwasher, Inari ran over to Izuku and tugged at his legs. Can we play outside? Izuku nodded, Inari smiled and proceeded to pull them outside to play. They were chasing her around the playset, reenacting scenes from the movie. It was a family moment, something both Momo and Izuku were keenly aware of. When they had to touch for the game, a jolt would run through them. Izuku told Inari it was time to go inside as it got darker. The little girl pouted and ran behind Momo. Mama Carpet Song. She said, looking up at Momo. Daddy, make us fly. She said, throwing up her arms. Please, Daddy. She said with a pout. Izuku sighed. What is she talking about? Momo asked. She wants us to sing a song from Aladdin and float around the yard. He wanted to make his daughter happy, but he knew that it would also mean that Momo would be very near to him, and he felt that he was manipulating the situation. Also, Inari pulled Momo farther in, no one sang with them. You can say no, Momo, he said, unsure what answer he hoped to hear. Momo shook her head. No, it's okay. I can sing with her, then if you are okay with it, I will take her to the bath tonight. Izuku tried to steady his heart, he swore he could hear Nana cheering in the back of his mind. Izuku stepped forward, and Inari jumped into his arms, Momo stepped closer. Her heat nearly thumbed out of her chest when Izuku and Inari held their hands. As she took their hands, she swore she felt electricity running through her when she and Izuku touched them. Do you know the words? He asked quietly. I do, she said, blushing, I have been learning the songs from the movies she likes. What do I do? Just place your feet on mine, I won't drop you, I promise. Izuku slipped his arm around her waist, as she came in close, her scent filled his nose. Their hearts were pounding, she placed an arm around his shoulders and the other around Inari. He closed his eyes, and they started to float up when he opened them. Izuku blushed, looking at Momo so close to him, her eyes glistened as she returned his gaze. I can show you the world. Shining, shimmering, splendid. Tell me, princess, now when did. You last let your heart decide. The slowly started drifting, his gaze drifting back between them both, and Ari snuggled into Momo. Momo felt her heart swell. 
They saw Inari gently closed her eyes in bliss as she pulled them with her little arms. I can open your eyes, take you wonder by wonder, over, sideways, and under, on a magic carpet ride, a whole new world, a new fantastic point of view, no one to tell us no, or where to go, or say we're only dreaming. Momo leaned against his shoulder as she looked down at Inari nestled between them, her rich voice pouring out. A whole new world, a dazzling place I never knew. But now, from way up here, it's crystal clear, that now, I'm in a whole new world with you. Now I'm in a whole new world with you. His head tilted forward, resting on top of Momo's. Unbelievable sights, indescribable feeling, soaring, tumbling, freewheeling, through an endless diamond sky. A whole new world. He didn't realize that they were going higher than he usually did. Don't you dare close your eyes. A hundred thousand things to see. Hold your breath, it gets better. She turned her gaze towards him. I'm like a shooting star. I've come so far. I can't go back to where I used to be. He tightened his grip around her slender waist. A whole new world. Every turn a surprise. With new horizons to pursue. Every moment red letter. Their forehead were pressed against each other, their eyes locked. I'll chase them anywhere. There's time to spare. Let me share this whole new world with you. A whole new world. A whole new world. That's where we'll be. That's where we'll be. A thrilling chase. A wondrous place. He instinctively brought them down closer to the ground. They could feel an Ari nuzzling between them, and they heard her contented sigh. For you and me. Their lips met before their feet touched the ground, it was soft. Tender. Warm. In a word, wonderful. A giggle of Inari brought them back to the world, and both blushed furiously. I will take Inari for a bath now, Momo said quietly. Izuku didn't know what to say, whether to apologize or stutter out an explanation. Momo did the talking for him. That was my first kiss, she looked up at Izuku through her eyelashes. I couldn't have dreamed of it being any better or with anyone else. Izuku was speechless as Momo, with Inari in her arms, walked back into the dorms. With Inari in her arms, Momo walked back into the little apartment, blushing as she grabbed Inari's bath bag and pajamas. Mama read, Inari giggled. Mama and Daddy kiss like the movie. We did, didn't we? Momo whispered. I love you, Mama, Inari said, nuzzling her shoulder. Momo's heart pounded against her chest from the memory of the kiss and those sweet words from the little girl on her shoulder. I love you too, an air, she replied, kissing her head. Now, how about a bath in the big baths? Big bath, yeah. They made their way over to the baths. They weren't alone very long as Kayoka and Sue joined them, happy to see the princess. They both froze when they heard, No, Mama, no, wash my hair. Yes, Inari, we are washing your hair today. See, I got you the princess shampoo. She said back, Princess shampoo. Inari said, looking at the bottle, and there were princesses on it. Okay, Mama. The little girl settled down and consented to her hair being washed. Sue and Kayoka patiently waited until they were all soaking in the tub. Sue was playing with an air when Kayoka scooted next to Momo, Mama. Did something happen that you want to share with the rest of us? When she saw Momo blush and could hear her heart pounding, Kayoka knew something happened. Something did happen. OMG, what happened? But first, do I need to help you hide a body? Cause I got your back, and I know where I can get my hands on shovels. No shovels are needed. Momo fidgeted, hiding her face with her hands. It caused Kayoka to laugh. She just started calling me it when she got home from daycare. She entered the building, wiggled free, and ran over, and it flew out her mouth. I thought it was a mistake, but then she repeated it, and when I tried to correct her, she sounded so heartbroken. Momo peeked through her fingers at Kayoka, who was smiling at her. Sue had come closer with Inari, Inari, who is Mama. She asked the little girl. Inari looked at Sue, then Momo, and pointed, Mama too, she said proudly. Sue thought about it. Two, like two, she said, holding up two fingers. Inari nodded. Who is Mama one? Mama one is in H heaven, she watches me with Grandma. The little girl said, a little sad. Momo leaned towards Inari, are there any other mamas? Part of Momo wanted to her no, but she suspected there was at least one more, and as long as that added up, she would be okay. She was worried that all the girls would now be mama, though Inari had called Sue by her name and Kayoka, Ko. Inari nodded her head, Itsu, Mama Itsu. The little girl said, Kayoka pointed at Sue. Is Tsu mama? Inari shook her head. Am I mama? Inari shook her head again. Is Itsu mama? Inari nodded. She looked at Momo, are you okay with that? Yes, Momo replied, feeling relieved but curious about why the thought of sharing Inari was that she was okay with it as long as it was with Itsuka. While she was musing to herself, she heard it and froze. Inari, what happened today, Kayoka said with a sly smile. I go to school, then I come home, get kisses from Mama, then we watch Genie and eat, then we float, Mama and Daddy sing, then Mama and Daddy kiss. The little girl said it also proudly, especially the last part. Sue and Kayoka turned and looked at Momo, who was making a lovely impression of a tomato, once again hiding her face in her hands. Was it a kiss on the cheek? Sue asked. Inari shook her head. Was it on the lips? Inari nodded her head. It was like movies. I think I should get out now, Momo said. Oh hell no, Kayoka said. Inari, do you want to get out of the bath? No, play more, she said. Please, Mama. Momo glared at the smirking Kayoka and giggling Sue. That was so mean, Kayoka. Okay, we can play some more princess. Sue leaned forward. I want the details. Spill it, girl, Kayoka said. What is this floating? 
Momo, still blushing, started describing what happened after dinner. When she finished, Tsu just fell back in the tub as she was floating. I want that, she said. Kind of cheesy, Kayoka said, tapping her jacks together. Momo and Sue looked at her with an O, oh, really. Kayoka looked away quickly, but I can dig it, I wouldn't pass that up. Sue asked, what about Achako's date with him tomorrow? Momo frowned, I don't like it. I don't want him to go, but we haven't talked about anything, and I need to figure out some things myself as well. I don't think Izuku feels that way about her, and he doesn't seem like the type to run around kissing girls, and if he is, then there is a lot I need to think about. But you are okay with her shooting her shot. Kayoka said as she started playing with Inari. He isn't my boyfriend dot 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 yet, she said with a smile. If he was, and she knew that, then I would have a problem, Momo said, her voice clear and confident. Yet, Sue said. Yet, she responded. Good night. Momo returned to the quarters with Inari in her arms. Izuku opened the door, he looked confused, rubbing the back of his head. I don't know what to do right now. I don't either. Perhaps we should leave it to Inari, Momo said, blushing slightly. Should I come in to put you to bed? Inari nodded. Momo entered, carrying Inari to her room. When she laid Inari down, Inari held onto her hand and looked at her daddy to start singing. Dreamland, Mary Chapman Carpenter. Sun goes down and says good night. Pull your covers up real tight. By your bed, we'll leave a light. To guide you off to Dreamland. Momo's eyes widened as he started, slowly, her voice joined his. Inari was smiling brightly. Your pillow's soft, your bed is warm. Your eyes are tired when day is done. One more kiss and you'll be gone. On your way to Dreamland. Every sleepy boy and girl. In every bed around the world. Can hear the stars up in the sky. Whispering a lullaby. Who knows where you'll fly away. Winging past the light of day. The man and the moon and the Milky Way. Welcome you to Dreamland. Izuku was looking at her and then at his daughter. They both turned their attention to Inari, whose hand slipped from Momo as her eyes drooped. Every sleepy boy and girl. In every bed around the world. Can hear the stars up in the sky. Whispering a lullaby. Who knows where you'll fly away. Winging past the light of day. The man and the moon and the Milky Way. Welcome you to Dreamland. Momo leaned down and kissed Inari gently. She moved towards the door, watching Izuku do the same. He turned and saw her standing at the door, his heart thumped against his chest. They stepped out together, so very close to each other. How did you know that song? He asked. My mother would sing it to me, she whispered. She tilted her head towards him, he slowly leaned in, and they kissed again. It was just as tender, but this time uninterrupted, slowly, their arms encircled each other. Pressed against each other, their kiss deepened, timidly, she opened her mouth to invite him. Gently, their tongues touched, and electricity coursed through them. This kiss continued at this deep, passionate pace, not frantic, not aggressive. When they finally broke apart, she placed a hand on his chest. When she felt his heart pounding underneath her fingertips, she smiled. Don't say anything right now, she said. Just will you hold me for a little bit? Izuku wanted to say so much, ask questions, and kiss her again. He wanted so much, but he had learned long ago. He pulled her close and wrapped his arms around her shoulders as she slid hers around her waist. She pressed her head against his chest, listening to his heart thumping, the beating filling her ears in the quiet room. Gingerly, he rested his head atop hers, he closed his eyes, losing himself in the smell of her shampoo and lotion. Neither could say how long they stood there like that till he felt her grip loosen, and reluctantly she stepped back. We can talk about this later, I promise, she said. She leaned up and gently kissed his lips. But for now, good night, Izuku. Good night, Momo, he whispered. She smiled and tucked a stray strand of hair behind her ear before she moved away towards the door. When the door closed, he leaned back against the wall, wow. Hachako. She stood before the mirror, changing her clothes yet again. Not that she had a lot of options, but she wanted to make sure she looked her best. Finally, she settled on her pink sundress with black flowers embroidered along the hem, with a pair of black sandals, applied what little makeup she owned, and stepped out into the hall. As she was waiting for the elevator, Tenya stepped in and smiled. You look very nice today, Hachako, he said. Thank you, Ida. Any plans for your day off? She replied. Yes, actually. I am meeting my parents for dinner later. The elevator doors opened, and he nodded for her to step out first. Have a nice visit with your family, she called, walking towards the common room. She smiled when she saw Izuku and Inari waiting. He wore a black button-down shirt and blue jeans, while Inari wore a light blue sundress with her arch enemies on her feet. Hello, Hachako, you look very lovely today. Are you ready? Izuku said, smiling, shouldering a backpack. You look handsome, Izuku, and you look so pretty, Inari, she said. The little girl smiled and offered Hachako her hand to walk together. Izuku smiled and led them out the door, calls of having fun for Mina and Toru ushered them out the door. Itsuka and Momo. Itsuka came downstairs to find Momo talking with Kanoko and Set. She smiled at her friends as she approached. Well, I am ready to go when you are, she said. Momo bowed to the other two girls. It was a pleasure speaking with you. I hope we can do so again soon. With a friendly wave, she and Itsuka exited the building. We just need to head to the front gate. I have a car waiting for us. I almost forget how rich you are, Itsuka said, almost. Wait, am I going to be able to afford this? I just realized where I go to get my hair done, and you do are very different places. Of course you will, as your money is no good with me, Momo said, smiling. 
Momo, I couldn't. Itsuka began to protest till Momo took her hand, and a little jolt ran between them. Please, Itsuka, Momo whined. I never have had a best friend, and this is something that I have always wanted to do. Itsuka looked at Momo's pleading eyes. Fine, you win, but I get to buy lunch. Itsuka sighed. Momo smiled and pulled Itsuka into a hug before dragging her along. You're the best Itsuka. Itsuka was glad she didn't try to pay for the haircut or the manicure. There was no way she could have afforded it, but the experience was divine. The pampering, the service, the talent was beyond anything Itsuka could have imagined. As they were walking down the street to a local cafe, she noticed that she was getting some looks from those she passed. Of course, she had sent a photo to Izuku, and when he responded with a hubba hubba and a gif of a wolf howling and pounding on a table, she laughed. The stylist had trimmed and tamed Itsuka's wild hair, giving it a beautifully soft look that still showed Itsuka's charm and fit perfectly into her trademark side pony, though it was loose and flowing at the moment. Some precision highlights gave her hair a fiery appearance that Itsuka had to say she loved. The day had just been fantastic. She and Momo bantered back and forth, talking about school, just everything. Itsuka found herself even playfully flirting with the heiress. It shocked her in many ways. She remembered talking with Suijin like this, but when Suijin would tease back, it didn't make her feel the way it did with Momo. She mentally sighed to herself, for the love of God was wrong with her. First, there was the barrel of a complication known as Izuku and that stupid kiss she gave him in the infirmary. Now she was getting all giggly with Momo. When they entered the cafe, she didn't even realize they were sitting alone until she looked around. Wonder why they sat us in the back like this. I asked them too, Momo said, fidgeting slightly. Why? I wanted to talk to you, and I wanted us to have some privacy, Momo responded, opening the menu. Is everything all right? Itsuka said, reaching over and taking Momo's hand. Do I need to punch someone? I am good at punching someone. Maybe, Momo said, smiling and squeezing Itsuka's hand before letting go. What was your first kiss like? Oh, girl talk, she thought. Honestly, not very special. I was dating this boy briefly, and we kissed, and it was very underwhelming. Why? I am curious, Momo said, not looking up from the menu. Was that Ajiro? No, Ajiro was my second boyfriend, and that was the same, we kissed, but it didn't excite me. I always thought it would be exciting or make you feel some way, but it never did. I thought it was just me, and I let it go on too long, and he got hurt. Itsuka said, looking at the menu. You get your first kiss, or are you thinking about it? Both, actually, Momo said, smiling. Are you going to give me details? Itsuka said, leaning forward. Yes, but I have some more questions first, Momo said, setting the menu down. Fine, but do you promise to tell me everything? Itsuka said, finalizing her selection. You ready to order? Momo nodded and hit the button to summon the waitress. After they placed their orders and received their drink, Momo started again. Do you know where Izuku went today? No, Itsuka replied with a shake of her head. Where? On a date, but I don't think he knows it's a date. Momo said, paying close attention to Itsuka's reaction when she saw the sadness cross her friend's eyes. It all but confirmed her suspicions. How did that happen? She said, trying not to be interested. He made a deal with Achako that after the battle trials, he would take her to go get Machai after she agreed to his plan, allowing him to confront Ajiro. He promised Machai, she suggested this weekend. He thinks that sounds like a good time to take Inari out as well. She said, shrugging. Does she like him? Itsuka asked. Yes, she does, Momo responded, watching Itsuka closely. He saved her during the exam, and she has had a crush on him since. Well, that's good, Itsuka said. I guess if he is ready to move on. Her voice betrayed the ache her heart was feeling. Why are you telling me this? I just have one more question, and it is vital, Momo said, leaning forward and taking Itsuka's hand. Itsuka nodded as the mood changed. How long have you been in love with Izuku? Itsuka froze, she started to deny it, but Momo stopped her. Please, Itsuka, I need to know the truth. Why? Why do you need to know that? She replied, hints of anguish in her voice. Because I am in love with him, Momo said. Itsuka went to pull away, but Momo held her hand firm. Are you in love with him? Itsuka didn't know what to do, a best friend and Izuku, was she already too late? Since I met him when we were twelve. Then I met Suijin and tried to convince myself that it would go away, but it just got worse, she found out and told me we could figure it out. We could still be friends. Is that what you are telling me? Itsuka was almost frantic. Yes, Momo said, Itsuka was stunned. I want to go find Izuku right now and tell Achako to stay away. If any other girl were out with him, I would do the same, all except dot 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 you. I, what, was all Itsuka could manage. I don't know much about love or anything. I want to make Izuku happy and die to protect Inari. But you do something to me, I don't understand. Maybe it's because you are my best friend or maybe I don't know. I want to have a life with Izuku and Inari, and I want you with us, I can't explain it, but it won't be right if you are not there. Momo took a deep breath and sat back. I kissed him last night, it wasn't planned, and it was everything I could dream of. I want you to find out if that is true for you. I can't. I don't dot 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 oh sweet baby Jesus. She said, putting her head in her hands. Momo, Itsuka, could you be happy being with Izuku, Inari, and me? Momo said, staring into Itsuka's eyes. Like I said, I don't know what is happening between us, but I know I want you with me. I know I am okay with kissing him if I see you kissing him. You are crazy, Itsuka said. You are fucking insane. Thank you. I have to find out, I need to know. 
Izuku and Achako. Achako looked at the luxury SUV with wonder. It was the fanciest car she had ever been in. Holy cow, Izuku, how did you afford this? Izuku blushed, which made Achako immediately regret her statement. I didn't actually, my mentor bought it for me. I protested, but when he showed me all the safety features and awards, I couldn't say no well because of Inari. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said anything, she said. Way to start things off with my foot in my mouth. She thought, it's okay, Achako, thank you for coming out with us today, he said, smiling immediately, banishing her negative thoughts. We don't know each other that well, and you seem nice, I hope we can be friends. Only friends. She felt a little let down by the thought, but then she heard Inari behind her asking for music and realized even more that he was a father and had to keep his daughter in mind before everything else. They had only been in school for a week while she may be crushing on him, even if he thought she was cute, he had to take it slow. Thank you for inviting me and for the machai, she said, smiling. I would dare forget about the machai, he said with a light laugh. Thanks for having my back at the trials, it meant a lot to me. She smiled brightly as they headed to Hinshitsu Outdoor Shopping Plaza. She was a little nervous when he told her where they would be going, being a girl of limited budget, but she was pleased when she looked online and saw the reviews for how good of deals they offered. When they arrived, Achako was feeling excited. It was an outdoor shopping mall, and it was decently busy but not too bad. When Izuku loaded Inari into her stroller and they started walking side by side, she caught a glimpse of them in a reflection and mused how they looked as a couple. Then, she began noticing looks from other patrons, making her uncomfortable, like she was out of place. She paused to look at herself in a reflection, ensuring something wasn't woefully wrong. You look fine, he said, suddenly pulling her back to reality. Very pretty, it's Inari and I, he continued. At first, they are curious, wondering if she is my sister, but then they realize that she is my daughter, and with you by our side, it is obvious that you are not her mother. Society doesn't look fondly at this situation. If you want to do your shopping on your own, we can meet up later. Hell no, Achako said. I came to hang out with you and Inari. I don't care if people stare, I need to get used to it. When I go pro, my costume is a little tight, she said with a giggle. Izuku smiled, but it looks good, and thanks for understanding Achako. It took her a bit, but soon, she could block it out, they did some clothes shopping for Inari. Achako found a fantastic store where she could purchase a few pairs of jeans and new shirts for a great price. She thought the jeans might be tight when she asked Izuku for his opinion, and he said amazing, it sealed the purchase. The most fun was when they spied a carousel in the center, and all went on together. Inari wanted to ride again, and this time, Achako took her by herself and even got the girl to sit in the rocket with her, Inari's laughs made it all better. Izuku walked over to a drink stand, getting some apple juice for his princess and water for him and Achako. As he walked back, he found a spot where he could see the girls, and they would wave as they went around. Is that your little sister? A voice said beside him. Izuku turned and looked, it was a woman, probably in her thirties, with black hair and eyes, rather curvy. No, that's my daughter and a classmate. He responded. Oh, your daughter, so young. She said, her voice carried a hint of chastisement, but it had more of a teasing tone. Where is the little one's mother? She is no longer with us, he said. It was standard questioning he would receive when someone would start this normal line of conversation. Sorry to hear that, she said. It must be hard to raise one so young on your own, how do you do it? I have a good support network and some people I trust to have my back, he replied. But it is hard, there are things I am unsure of how to teach her, so I read many books and such. Do you think about what kind of quirk she may have? No, not really, he said. But what if it is something, she leaned in and whispered. Bad like a villain's quirk or a blood quirk. A villain's quirk. Oh, lady, if you only knew how unironic that question really is. I wouldn't care, I would get her any support she needed to be happy. Quirks are not evil, the person and what they do with it make them villainous. Do you truly believe that? The woman asked. Or are you just lying? That is very rude, Izuku replied. But to answer your question, nothing matters more than my daughter's happiness. Blood quirk, no quirk, the most amazing quirk in the history of quirks. As long as she was happy, it wouldn't matter. I apologize that was rude, the ride is ending. I hope you have a good day, she said as she walked away. Toodles, the woman said as she melted into the crowd. Izuku didn't have much time to think about it as Achako returned with Inari. He noticed that Inari had a rocket ship balloon that she most definitely didn't have before. Achako blushed. She pointed to it and wanted it. I hope you are okay that I got it for her. That is fine. He said smiling. I would have done the same thing, but I am a sucker like that. She is very persuasive. Achako agreed. In, Inari said, mimicking Stitch, making Izuku laugh. How about we break for some food then? After there is a bookstore I want to go by, we can go get Machai. You had me at Machai, Achako said. It was everything Achako could hope for, he was pleasant and paid for lunch despite her protests. He focused on her and Inari, even when more appealing girls walked by. She saw him buy some parenting books at the bookstore, and then he picked out coloring books for Inari. Achako found a new book in a space opera series she was reading. The matcha shop was great, and true to his word, he bought her a whole box to take home while they sat and ate some in the shop. The only thing was that he didn't look at her that way, she could see it. 
Once they returned home and separated, she sat in her room for a few minutes before changing her clothes. It had been a nice day, fun, and everything had been right, but she just knew there was someone else. Someone else, sitting on the bench outside his apartment. He heard his name being called, he saw Itsuka come around the corner. She was still in her outfit from going out with Momo, she gave him a little twirl. Her black skirt flared out perfectly, the final rays of sunlight catching her hair. You look amazing, Itsuka. No Momo. She said that she was going to head to her room, she said she was tired. What about you? How was your day? She said, walking over. It was nice. Got everything I wanted to get, got to know Achako better. He said. Itsuka looked around, where is Inari? Kind of early for her to be in bed. She didn't get her nap today, and it was a long day for her. After dinner, she didn't even make it 20 minutes into her movie before putting her head on my lap and falling asleep. He responded, pointing to the open window. So you got to know Achako better, huh? Hitsuka said, wiggling her eyebrows. All the while, inside, she prayed that it wasn't what she was implying. Oh, baby, it was only because you left me so lonely, he said with a smirk. Are you hungry? I could eat, she said, following him inside. So, anything interesting happen? Today, no, not really. He said, going to the kitchen to fix her a plate. Something did happen yesterday, though. Do you want to talk about it? She said, sitting at the table. Can I ask you a hypothetical question? He said, heating the food. Really? She said, rolling her eyes, sure. If you kissed your friend, and it made you feel a certain way, then they didn't want to talk about it, but you ended up kissing again, what would you do? He said, leaning against the counter. Hypothetically. He nodded. It would be complicated. I wouldn't know to push forward or pull away if it was me. I would probably push forward as no kiss has ever made me feel that way. He set the plate of food in front of her. Would you feel guilty? Guilty. She said, taking a bite of food. Okay, say you and I kissed, it was all intense and made us feel stuff, he said. I dream of that almost daily, you idiot. She nodded. You are my best friend, I couldn't lose you, I need you with me. Don't say that, please don't say that. Inari, you are the most important people in my life. Will we be betraying Suijin? That forced her mind to stop. I don't know, she said softly. I know Suijin would want us to be happy, and if she was gone, why wouldn't she want us to be happy together? If I move on romantically, am I betraying her? That you have to answer for yourself, she said. As long as whomever you move on as you're in Inari's best interests at heart. Then no, I don't think so. She wouldn't want you to be lonely or Inari not to have a mother. As long as you don't cut Suijin out of Inari's story, I think all that would matter is your two's happiness. She continued to eat her dinner. Do you like my hair? You look beautiful, Itsu. I have always liked your hair, but now it is fiery. He stared at her warmly with a gentle smile on his face. He reached out and squeezed her hand. Don't do that, Izu, don't look at me like that, with beautiful green eyes. Please don't call me Itsu. Why does your hand feel so warm? I don't know if I can take it. I may do something I regret, something that I can't walk back. He took her empty plate and walked over to the sink. He couldn't see how she looked at him. A deep longing look found its way into her eyes. I hope you find someone who kisses you and gives you that feeling, Itsu, I want you to be happy. He said, washing the plate. I am only happy when I dream. When I dream, I dream of you and Inari. I have never kissed you, but all the other kisses are compared to some fantasy in my head. It is because I want to give myself to you, hold you, wake up with you, stand in the doorway, and watch you sing Inari to sleep. Hitsuka thought. I do, too, she said in almost a whisper. He turned and caught her looking at him. Her eyes were different than he had ever seen. She almost appeared to be in pain. Izuku walked around the table and lowered his face to meet hers. He could see tears in the corner of her eyes. He reached out with his other hand and wiped a tear from the corner of her eye. Talk to me, Itsu. He whispered. Oh, fuck am I crying. Please don't touch me like that. Why did you have to whisper it? Please kiss me, kiss me right now. If you do it first, I can walk it back if needed. If I do it, then I don't think I can. Please, Izuku, kiss me. I need to fucking know I can take this anymore, my heart can't take it. I can be a silly fantasy, I can be a lie I told myself, but I need to know. Izuku stared deeply into Itsuka's eyes, eyes he had beheld countless times before. He thought about kissing her, it wasn't the first time he had always pushed those thoughts away. When he was with Suijin, he had even thought about, until coming to university, only two women were his fantasy, Suijin and Itsuka. Adult seen incoming. She reached out and grabbed his shirt, tears leaking down her face. Please, she whispered. I need to know, please, Izuku, kiss me. Her heart was about to explode or break, he couldn't decide a course of action. She had danced along that line so much, and now she had crossed. She had to know. If she were silent, she would watch him walk away with Momo and be out of reach for the rest of her life. She had already endured that once and was not keen on bearing that again. They leaned closer, her eyes closed, and the whispered please escaped her lips. He closed the distance, their lips meeting. It wasn't electric. It was a raging inferno, Itsuka's mind went blank, and her arms immediately went around his neck, her hands grabbing his hair. His arms wrapped around her waist, pulling her in deep. They kissed in a near frenzy, their tongues exploring each other's mouth, desperately, hungrily. They didn't even know they had risen to their feet, stumbling across the room till they fell on the couch. One of his hands traced up her back to the back of her head. When she felt him grab her hair, she moaned. He pulled her head to the side and began to attack her neck. She begged him not to stop as she writhed against him. 
She felt his erection pressing against her, and she moved her legs to straddle him, grinding down on him with near desperation. He could feel her wetness, his hips rising to meet her. She freed her arms and, reaching down, started to undo his pants. Once loose, she reached down and grabbed his stiff cock, his eyes shot open sitting up, and she whimpered as it slipped out of reach. He grabbed the front of her blouse and tore it open, buttons flying all over the room. She reached down and mimicked his action, stripping her out of her shirt. Her bra flew, and as his mouth found her breasts, she ground down against his crotch more. Urgently, she freed him from his underwear. She screamed his name, feeling him so close to her entrance that he bucked his hips up in pleasure. He rolled her onto her back, his hand snaked between her legs and swiftly tore her soaked black G-string away. He just kissed down her stomach, she opened her legs as he dived into her sex. His tongue danced along her clit, she grabbed his hair and ground her sex against his face. When he slipped a finger inside her, it wasn't long until she exploded all over his face. Her screams echoing in the room, she pulled up, tasting herself on his lips, she could feel his member against her sex, her dripping sex. She reached down to line him up when Inari's cry shattered the illusion, bringing reality crashing down around them. Their eyes wide as they stared at each other for a moment. He scrambled to his feet, putting himself away before dashing towards the room. Itsuka lay on the couch, stunned, shocked, happy, confused. It has been more than anything her fantasies had laid before her, it was more than the kiss in the infirmary. As her senses returned, she realized her state, shirt torn, bra somewhere, pant is gone. She dashed to his room and grabbed the first shirt she could find. She could hear Inori calming down. She didn't know what to do or what to say or do. She didn't know whether to run or to wait. There was no going back, that line had been broken and scattered to the wind. As she heard Inari's crying stop, she peeked into the room and saw him putting her back to sleep. She moved across the room, and they just stared at each other when he walked out. Itsu, shut up, Izuku, she said quickly. Stay over there, please. If you come too close, I don't know. I need to think, I love you, I have always loved you. Just give me to tomorrow, I need to calm down. We all need to talk tomorrow, you, Momo, and I I know you kissed her, and I know this just made shit very complicated. Can you give me that? Just till tomorrow, I swear. Tomorrow, was all he could say. She darted out the back door and off into the night. Izuku didn't know what to do, he had kissed Momo, now he had kissed Itsuka and much more. They were about to. He needed help. He grabbed his phone. Dad, I have a problem. Do you know how hard it is to run from one dorm on the UA? Campus to the other in a thigh-high black skirt with no underwear on. Not many do, but Itsuka Kendo now understood that dilemma. She wanted to murder Izuku for tearing them off, but killing him didn't come to mind when she thought about it. She could feel her face flush and her sex react. She stopped and composed herself the best she could, then Power walked into the dorms, said a cur hello to whoever was downstairs, and didn't want to risk walking up the stairs sans panties, so she headed for the elevator. She heard someone shout a question about her shirt as she was wearing one of Izuku's. Once again, the truth was a no-go. Oh, he ripped it open in the heat of passion, and I couldn't find my bra, so rather than walk across campus with my tits hanging out, I borrowed a shirt. Inari got sick, I need to shower, she called out. Arriving on her floor, she quickly stepped past one of her classmates and raced into her room, quickly stripping out of her clothes, she ran to the shower. Standing there naked, thoughts of murder once again crossed her mind. Hickeys, she had a hickey on her neck, two to be exact, and a few on her breasts. Once the water came even remotely close to a comfortable temp, she stepped inside as her mind raced to catch up to her. It had been everything she could have wanted and more, she blushed, realizing it was her screams of passion that woke Inari, if not, he would have definitely scored. She had a maniacal laughing fit when she realized there was no condom or birth control, she had no damn clue if today was a safe day, not that she even knew how to track that. And then, then his mouth was. Her mind may have tried to block it out, but her body remembered. In for a penny, in for a pound. She leaned back against the shower wall as her hand fell between her legs, and her mind supplied the images in surprising detail. Once she calmed herself, she showered and stepped out. Toweling herself off, she pulled on an unripped pair of panties and put back on his shirt, collapsing onto the bed. She looked at her phone and five missed messages and three calls from Izuku. Izuku, Itsuka, are you okay? Izuku, Itsuka, I am so sorry. I don't know what came over me. Izuku, are we okay? Izuku, did I destroy our friendship? I know you said tomorrow, but I need to know that I didn't blow this shit up past the point of no return. Izuku, please answer. Itsuka took a deep breath, of course, he was freaking out. She had told him she was in love with him and knew about Momo. Itsuka, I am fine, I told you to kiss me and not stop. I wanted that just as much. I promise we are good. We will talk about it tomorrow. I swear I am still here for you and your friend. I know it's asking a lot not to freak out, but I promise. Believe in me? Okay. Izuku, okay, thank you for texting me back. I will wait till tomorrow. Itsuka, good night Izuku. Izuku, night Itsu. The knock at her door startled her. Who is it? She called. It's set. Open up, please. Set, I just got out of the shower. Can we talk about this tomorrow? She responded. Itsuka, I need you to open the door, set said in a firm tone. If not, then I may have to call campus security. Itsuka immediately bolted to the door and yanked it open, Set just stepped in and pushed it closed. What is going on, Set? Itsuka said, confused. 
Why would you need to call campus security? Your neck was bruised. You are wearing a strange shirt. You look like you may have been crying and flushed. And you didn't even look at me when you stepped off the elevator before running off. Set said, staring intently at Itsuka. Wait, are those hickeys? Itsuka blushed and tried to hide the marks with her hair. I swear to you, Set, I am just fine. Nothing happened that required campus security. Can you not say anything about this, please? I won't, but what happened? Set eyes widened. Did you and Momo? No, Itsuka said immediately, though the stray thought of what kind of kiss her Momo was did cross her mind. She would have to unpack something later. She looked at Set. She didn't know the girl well but knew that Set was putting in the effort and the girl had come to check on her, thinking something terrible had happened. Itsuka went to her mini fridge and handed Set a coke before she sat down, motioning for the girl to do the same. I had been in love with Izuku since not long after he walked into my family's dojo when we were twelve. She began. He had a great girlfriend who became my best friend. I thought it was just a crush and that it would go away. I never did. He was this fantasy in my head that all others were measured against. Fantasies are normally that way, Set responded. Yeah, eventually, I just thought it was just me, that this fantasy in my head was just that. That I was trying to hold other people to an impossible expectation. That a kiss wasn't supposed to make you feel that way or spark your dreams. And you never told him or his girlfriend. No, Suijin figured it out and told me that we would figure it out, that she wasn't going to let me pull away over something like this, Hitsuka said, popping her soda open. Wow, Set said, following suit. Top-notch girl. No kidding, right? Itsuka looked at the photo on her desk. So I moved away and tried to date some people, you know how that went, but then I returned. And I have been spending all this time with Izuku and Inari, and all the feelings just roared back. Something happened, and tonight, I just broke down and begged him to kiss me. She was now staring at her soda can. I had to know. And, Set prodded. It was everything I fantasized about and more, she said. Set noted that there wasn't the level of joy one would expect. It was an inferno of emotion we just started going at. She pointed at her neck. It was a romance novel, then we woke up Inari. It snapped me back to reality, and I ran. Oh dot 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 that doesn't seem that bad, Set winced. But he is into you well, Set motioned to Itsuka's neck. Yeah, that is kind of a problem, Itsuka said as she fell back onto her bed. I am not the only one into him or that he is into. They kissed last night as well. Nothing like what happened with me and him, but still. Is this guy a player? Set said in confusion. He kissed another girl last night and then made out with you tonight. No, he is not a player, but here is the rub. This other girl is pretty much my best friend. I am guessing, Momo. Yeah, when she took me out today, she told me everything. Then she tells me she is willing to share him with me because that thought doesn't bother her, and she wants me with them. Encourages me to go talk to him, and this happened. Itsuka sat up, looking at Set. And how do you feel about her? Set said. Like, do you enjoy kissing girls? I don't know, but the thought of kissing her isn't an immediate no, we are trying to figure it out. Itsuka stood up and walked around the room a little. Tomorrow we were all supposed to hang out and go to the park, and now. I haven't got a clue. Okay, this is complicated, Set said, getting to her feet. Do you want to unpack whatever happens with you and Momo? I think so, Itsuka responded. I am willing to explore it, as it is not a hard no. What if you saw her and Izuku making out? Like however you were tonight, Set asked. Itsuka stopped and thought about it. Momo on her back legs spread, Izuku's face buried between her thighs. Sweat glistening on Momo's luscious breasts, her plump lips calling out in please, calling for Itsuka to. Well shit, Itsuka said, sitting down. I may be more into exploring that than I may have thought. What if you say him making out with someone else that way? Set said, smirking, taking a drink of her soda. Itsuka didn't have to think very hard. Super punch. That was way too easy. Set smiled. Look, if you both are willing to share, and it sounds like there may be some attraction between you, then it just sounds like a throuple to me. Set patted her shoulder. It is not that crazy my parents have an open marriage. And I would never question if they loved each other. Can it be that simple? Itsuka wondered aloud. It can, Ibera will explode, as will Jirota and whoever that other guy is. She paused, looking for the word. Ajiro, oh, and Tetsu will be upset he has a little crush on you. I don't know what to say to that. I'm flattered, Itsuka said, raising an eyebrow in confusion. Father and son. Seriously, son. Toshi said, rubbing his nose. Look, I didn't plan these things, they just happened. He said sheepishly. With Momo, I felt that something was starting, and then with Itsuka, she has been the other woman in my life since I was twelve. I always thought she was pretty, but I had Suijin. Whenever I thought of her that way, I would chastise myself and push it down. Okay, well, the first thing is that Monday morning, you are going to go see Recovery Girl to get A, condoms and B, birth control shot, Toshi said, looking at the boy. If enthusiasm hadn't woken up my granddaughter and the two of yours, you could have been well on your way to making her a big sister and ruining young Kendo's chances at being a hero. Izuku wanted to say something, but he couldn't. There is no reason for you not to be using the advances in modern medicine to remove that possibility from the table, especially with your track record. But as far as your lady problems are concerned, to quote a classic movie, son, you are on your own. Toshi said. Really? Izuku said shocked. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I have minimal romantic experience to draw upon. But I can tell you that you need to talk with both of them and make a hard decision. 
It is unfair to drag this on any further, he said sternly. You're right, he said with a deep sigh. There is something else. Oh Lord, tell there is not another girl. No, nothing like that, he said quickly, waving his hands in front of himself defensively. I was planning on telling them the truth about one for all, he paused as Toshi raised an eyebrow, waiting for him to continue. I care about them deeply, and they are also extremely dear to Inari, I want them to know the truth, especially if we are discussing a relationship. I cannot object to this, in all honesty, Toshi said. I can tell how close you are with them, and all the time I have spent with them, I know that they love and care for Inari deeply. And with your recent developments, it would be prudent so they can make an informed decision. But I don't believe a reveal of being a master criminal could deter those two young ladies. Even that would be a large if. I am scared. Izuku finally said. I am afraid I let things go too far, I am afraid I am not ready, I am terrified that I am dishonoring Suijin. The only thing I was more scared of was if I could take care of Inari. I can't do much to swag your fears, son, Toshi said, placing his arm around the boy's shoulders. But even I can tell how much those ladies care about you, as long as you proceed with that in mind, I am sure you will do well. I may not know Suijin personally, but know that she would want you to be happy, that she would want you to live. So live, son, don't bury your head in the sand, and don't run away. Thanks, dad, Izuku did, leaning in. Momo. She lay in bed, wondering about tomorrow and Izuku and Itsuka. She didn't understand her feelings towards Itsuka but knew she wanted her by her side and in her life. She knew it might be being greedy, but she had read so many stories where it all worked out. Why couldn't it work out for her? She wanted the child, the boy, and the girl. Momo Yayurazu knew that anything was possible if you worked for it. And if she had to work day and night, she would get what she wanted. Sunday. If it could be defined in a word, it was awkward. A blind man in space could see it. Inari, though, didn't care. All she cared about was that her mama was here. And when Itsuka showed up, her second mama was there. And this time the common room heard it all. When Momo arrived downstairs, Inari was playing with a toy car, pushing it around on the floor. But when Momo's feet touched the bottom of the stairs, the car didn't exist. She stood up and bolted over as fast as her feet could and grabbed Momo's legs. With one word that froze the common room. Mama. Momo either didn't notice her classmate's stunned expressions or didn't care. It was a combination of both, in case you were curious. Momo's smile threatened to take on a life of its own as she scooped up the little bundle and twirled her around. Hello, princess. How was your day yesterday? Inari, as sin sink of a manner that a two-half-year-old could begin to tell her about her day, hyper-focused on the carousel. And the balloon Acha had gotten for her. Momo just listened as she walked towards the couch and sat down with Inari, deep into recounting her story. Izuku came walking out about this time lugging some things. With skill and practice, Momo rose from the couch, taking some things in her free arm, never taking her eyes off Inari or the conversation. She leaned over and kissed Izuku's cheek, causing him to freeze. Do we need anything else? She said. I am just going to grab a picnic basket, and then we need to meet up with Itsuka, he said, stunned. Good. Then I will head out with Inari and meet you in front of the 1B dorms before we head to the car. She then casually walked out of the common room with a sway in her hips accented by the black sundress with red roses. Minta, Denki, Siro, Fumi, and Mina were frozen. I'll see you guys later, Izuku said. They all mumbled a response. It wasn't until the door was closed, and they were gone that Mina finally snapped out of it. What the fuck was that? Momo in class 1B. Excuse me, is Itsuka here? Momo said, holding Inari's hand. I think so, Pony said, her finger by her mouth. She then turned to Inari, who looked cute in jeans and an All Might t-shirt. Good morning, Inari. Good morning, Pony. She smiled as she remembered the blonde's name. Very good, Pony said. Won't you like to enter? Yes, and thank you, Momo said, following the girl in. I will go get her, Pony said before heading off. Welcome to the 1B dorms, Nito said as he came downstairs in a sweeping entrance. Your very presence brightens our living quarters, Ms. Yairazu. To what do we owe the honor of your visit with such a lovely child? Inari put herself behind Momo's legs. I am here to pick up Itsuka as she joins me on an outing. Should you require an additional escort, I would be happy to offer my services, or perhaps afterward, you would like to come over so we could study together. He said with a boy as his eyes told a very different story. On the other hand, Momo smiled politely while Inari said, No, you stay here. I am afraid I must decline your invitation. Monoma, I have all the escorts I require today. Manga emerged from the kitchen, stifling a laugh. Inari immediately bolted towards the boy, stopping, throwing her hands over her head and saying, Pop. Manga laughed, and the word appeared above his head, and when it popped, Inari started giggling. Whose sweet laughter is that I hear, Itsuka said, stepping off the elevator. Mama. Inari yelled, bolting for the girl. Itsuka was stunned as she picked up her goddaughter. Jiroda, sitting in the common room, let loose a low growl. Kanoko, who was behind Itsuka, giggled. Em, I your mama, Itsuka said, staring into Inari's eyes. Yes, Inari said. You mama and Momo mama, she added proudly. I think I can live with that, she thought momentarily, then pointed to Kanoko. Is she mama? Nu, Inari said, giggling. That made Itsuka feel better that she was only sharing the title with Momo. When did this start? Itsuka said, walking towards Momo. Friday, Momo said, blushing some. Are you ready for today? 
Honestly, no, but that is my doing, Itsuka said, hugging Inari. Momo looked at her quizzically. Itsuka said goodbye to Hinoko as they exited the building. Family. Izuku was waiting by the car as the girls approached. He was trying desperately to wrap his mind around how today may go and failing miserably. Before he could say anything, Itsuka volunteered to sit in the back with Inari, much to the little girl's delight. Then, Izuku heard Inari call Itsuka Mama and said life had complicated things. Momo noticed that Itsuka and Izuku were avoiding eye contact. Not wanting to press the issue, she climbed into the front seat so they could begin their outing and, if the heiress had her way, the beginning of a new relationship. The drive to the park was filled with small talk to pass the time, everyone seeming to want to avoid the major conversation. When they arrived at the park, Itsuka smiled brightly. It was gorgeous, they found a spot near a pond in the playset. Momo did again, kissing his cheek and complimenting him on finding such a nice park. Itsuka witnessed this and didn't stir up any jealous feelings, which in her mind was good. They walked over with Inari to the playset. The little girl, once released, dashed ahead to climb the stairs to the slide. Are you going to tell me what is happening between you two? Momo asked. Something happened yesterday, Itsuka said, blushing. And it was more than either of us intended, so we are having difficulty addressing it. Is it because I am here? Momo said. Or is it because I kissed Izuku? Yes and no, Itsuka said. We would have a hard time regardless of whether you were here. Momo smiled. Itsuka, maybe we should talk before we address anything with Izuku. Well, there are some things I want to talk to you guys about before we address all the other stuff. He said, I think it would be best if we took care of our issue first, Izuku, Momo said. I may help with the other parts, Itsuka agreed. We will be right back. Momo and Itsuka. Itsuka, let's put aside Izuku for a minute, Momo said, Itsuka nodded. I am not sure how you feel, but I am attracted to you. When I think of you, I wonder things. I will be honest, my goal by the end of today is to be in a relationship with you and Izuku. Jesus, Itsuka said. You don't hold back. I do, but right now, I don't want to hold back as to lose one or both of you. Momo absently pushed a piece of hair behind her ear. I want you in my life, Itsuka, with Inari, Izuku, and I when I sit at night and think about it, I realize it won't be complete without you. At first, it was simple, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized I wanted to see if something was there beyond friendship. I have been so focused on Izuku that, honestly, I hadn't thought about it, Itsuka responded. But yeah, I also want to see what is between us. I know that the thought of you kissing Izuku doesn't make me angry, I find it hot. She added blushing. I asked him to kiss me yesterday. And, it wasn't all just in my head, apparently, it was in his as well, Itsuka said, looking away. Then kiss me, Momo said. She was stepping forward. What? Itsuka managed. I want you to kiss me, Momo said again. I want to see if there is a hint of a spark. But, Itsuka was at a loss, looking for an excuse. She was silenced when she turned to the heiress to say something as Momo stepped in and kissed her. It was so very different from Izuku, but... It was so soft and tender, but there was a hint of a spark there. Momo's lips pulled away from Itsuka. It wasn't the same as kissing Izuku, but she wanted to do it again, which she took as a good sign. I think something is there, Momo whispered. And I am interested in exploring that. Are you? So many things danced through Itsuka's head, good and bad. Naughty and nice, naughty and super playful. Could this work? Could they share Izuku and each other? Does this mean we will go on our dates? I would think so, Momo replied. I want Izuku to be both our boyfriend and you to be my girlfriend. I want that, too, Itsuka said. How did we end up here? She looked at Momo, who was smiling. I don't know, Momo replied. It is scary and exciting, I wonder if it is foolish, but then I don't care if it is. Some people are going to flip the fuck out, Itsuka said. As long as you, Inari and Izuku are by my side, I don't care, Momo said. This time, Itsuka stepped forward gently. She drew Momo into a kiss. This time, their lips parted, and their tongues gently and tenderly explored each other's mouths. There was a definite spark. Yeah, there is a spark there, Itsuka said as they broke apart. I must agree, now that we have settled that, we should return to Izuku and Inari to figure out the other side of this triangle, Momo said, returning to the playground. What if he doesn't figure it out? Itsuka asked as they walked back. We go home with, and when Inari goes to sleep, you kiss me again right before him, that should short-circuit him enough, Momo said, smiling. I think we all seriously underestimated you, Momo, Itsuka replied, shaking her head. It happens, Momo said with a shrug. Now that we have a better idea of what is happening between us let's settle things with Izuku. Izuku. Izuku had walked over and was sitting on a bench watching Inari playing in the sandbox when an older woman who was out walking her dog paused by the bench. Is she yours? The woman asked. Yes, he responded. She seems happy, the woman said. The dog moved over, looking at Izuku for some head scratches. It was a cute little thing, Izuku looked to the woman for permission. Once given, he leaned down to give the little puppers what it was asking for. I hope she is, I think she is. He said as his hand found the magical spot behind the dog's ear. It is what I strive for every day. Are you happy? The woman said, still looking at Inari with a gentle smile. At times, two hands now scratching the puppy. But aren't you scared about raising her in a society that will judge her? The woman said, looking at Izuku. Some look down on you too for your situation or will judge her if her quirk isn't acceptable. Then I guess I just have to change society, he said, not stopping scratching the dog but looking up at the woman. 
not just for her but for all those people that society looks down upon for something as stupid as an unacceptable quirk. How are you going to do that? She giggled as her dog flopped onto its side, enjoying Izuku's attention. He's some sort of hero or something. Not yet, but I want to be, he replied. I am a first year at UA, in the hero course. So money and fame. A hint of cynicism creeping into her voice. So money and some fame, he replied. Money just so I can take care of her. And enough fame that people will listen and pay attention to my deeds more than my words. You have to show society that there is a better way, and then you have to live it. It won't happen overnight, but change rarely does. You think you can make a change? She said, her gaze drifting back to Inari, as did Izuku's. For her, I would move Mount Fuji. I hope you aren't all just talk future hero, she said. With a gentle tug, the puppy got to its feet, obeying its master's command as they walked off. Izuku plus Momo plus Itsuka plus Inari equals family. It wasn't long before Momo and Itsuka walked back over, spotting the objects of their mutual affection they came walking over. They looked over at Inari, who seemed to be in her whole own little world moving sand around in her metal yellow dump truck. Izuku took a deep breath as they sat with him on either side of the bench. I know we have a lot to unpack with what has happened over the last few days, but there is something things I want you both to know before we get into that. Is this where you tell me you are a closet supervillain with plans of global domination? Momo said with a hint of levity. Or is there something more sinister? Itsuka added, like you secretly have a plot to kill all the kittens in the world to deprive the rest of us of kitten videos. That would be horrible, Momo said. They are so cute. A little squeal was at the end, making it even more adorable. No one is that evil, he said, smiling. Okay, this may sound like a standard disclaimer or that I am being overly dramatic, but this is very important. Both girls recognized the change in his tone and nodded. I need you guys to promise me that what I tell you here goes nowhere else. You cannot say anything to anyone ever. No matter what happens today, this never gets out as it could put Inari in danger. Itsuka was slightly worried. She felt that she knew almost everything about Izuku and that he was holding on to something that sounded this important, which was troublesome. She placed her hand on Izuku's shoulder. Nothing you could do would make me abandon you or Inari. I promise, whatever it is, that whatever happens today, I will always be there to protect her and you. Izuku, my intention and feelings have not shifted in the hours since we kissed. I will lay down my life for Inari as a good mother should. You have my word that, regardless of what happens, nothing will change that today. Momo said, squeezing his hand. He took a deep breath. As you both know, my quirk didn't manifest until shortly after my mom died. A bag of fruit snacks floated by his feet to his hand. This is my quirk. I named it Attraction after my mom, which was the name of her quirk. But your quirk is psychokinesis, Momo said. Yeah, that is what I thought as well, Itsuka said. That is what this conversation is about. I have been lying to you both and almost everyone else. Let me explain. He opened his other hand, and they saw the familiar green lightning. I was given this power when I was 16. Given, Itsuka said. He let the lightning continue over his hand. This is one of all. This quirk is transferable. It stockpiles energy and has been passed down to eight different people. I am the ninth. A transferable quirk, like you could give this quirk to someone else. Momo asked. Yes, I could give it to you or Itsuka, Inari, anyone. That is kind of terrifying, Itsuka said. On many levels, a transferable quirk would throw everything we know about quirks into chaos. If someone knew about this, they... Momo stopped and looked at Inari, Itsuka's gaze followed. They could kidnap Inari and make you give to them. That's why you said she could be in danger. From whom did you get it? All Might, he said quietly. Silence the day I saved Bekugo from the sludge villain, I had met All Might earlier when the same villain attacked me. He went to leave and jumped on his leg. We landed on a building, and I had to ask him if I could be a hero. That was such a weak quirk that had awakened so late in life, I could barely do anything with it. He looked over at Itsuka. I had hit a low place, my mom had died, Suijin and you were so far away, I was not too far removed from my drinking problem. Is this the drinking problem you mentioned when we first met? Momo asked. Suijin had moved away, and my mom died the day she left. After the funeral, a package showed up on my door with a bottle of Blanton's single barrel, and I got lost for a bit. I got sober and haven't touched it since. I had what was left of a bottle in the house, but I had Itsuka get rid of it as soon as she returned so I would falter with Inari coming into my life. Sorry, continue. You had asked All Might if you could be a hero, Momo said. He said no, Izuku paused, remembering that day. It hurt, but then I thought of my mom, Suijin, and you, Itsuka, and all our training. I told him he was wrong, I would be a hero. Itsuka smiled, the fire in his eyes was one of the things that made her fall in love with him. I came across that same villain attacking Bekugo. He must have gotten free when I hitched a ride on All Might. I ran in and was able to buy Bekugo some time. We were both about to die when All Might came in and saved us. After I got yelled at by the other heroes, All Might found me. He told me I could be a hero because I had acted when no one else did. I told him my feet moved on their own, to which he told me that is what heroes do. All Might had suffered a devastating injury some years ago and could not use his power as much anymore. He had been looking for a successor to pass the power to. It chose me. So what? Itsuka said. Huh. As that was not the response he was expecting. Why would this make me not want to be near you or my goddaughter? 
You should have told me earlier, but I understand why you didn't Izuku. For years, Suijin and I told you that you would be an awesome hero. All Might saw it too, she said, holding his hand. And if you had not had that power, Izuku, maybe you wouldn't have been able to save me when I was attacked. I am glad All Might saw what others in your life and my parents and I see in you. Your heart drives you to be a hero, not your power. I was afraid you guys would hate me. You, Itsuka, would be mad at me for keeping it from you. And that you, Momo, would look at me differently. Why would I do that, Izuku? You saved me, and you were my first real friend ever. I would not care if you got your power from wishing on a star. Momo said, My love for you is not predicated on your quirk or quirks. They are predicated on the person you are. My love for Inari is based on how much I want to keep her safe and give her the best possible life. You are the dumbest smart guy I know. Unless you told me that you murdered Suijin, nothing could make me ditch you. Itsuka added, wrapping her arm around his shoulder. I fell in love with you when you didn't have a quirk. I loved you after it manifested, and after last night, you know I still love you. I may not have given birth to Inari, but I love her as if I had. Then what do we do now? He said. I love you, Itsuka, I have had feelings for you for a long time, I just pushed them down and buried them. You are my best friend, and I was with Suijin. I always felt it wasn't right for me to think of you that way. Momo, ever since you came into my life, it has been this steady building of feelings of love. I don't want to choose between you two. I want to be selfish, I want you both in my life, as my girlfriends and Inari's mothers. He winced, expecting them to start yelling. Itsuka looked past him to Momo, both of their eyes were wet. Itsuka gently turned his face to her. Izuku Midoriya, I have been in love with you since we were twelve. Every other relationship has been held to the fantasy of you, every kiss was measured against what I dreamed about. I thought I was broken somehow, you proved that wrong last night. I love you. She leaned in, gently kissed him, and took Momo's hand. Momo, you are my best friend. Obviously, something else is building between us, and I don't want to let that go. I want to be selfish as well. I want you both. Momo smiled, my turn. She pulled Izuku into a kiss. I love you, I fell for you when you saved me. I didn't want to act or say anything not to cause either of us pain. As I got to know Inari, it reinforced that. But now I know that I love you, that I am in love with you, Izuku. Itsuka, you know how I feel, whatever is between us, I want to explore. I want you both. How does this work? Izuku asked. You date us, and we date each other, we go on dates together and parent Inari, Momo said. This is my first ever relationship, and I hope my last. We will have to figure it out as we go. What she said, Itsuka said. But I have waited too long for this, she said, leaning in and kissing Izuku deeply, as they broke apart, she whispered. My boyfriend. She stood up and walked to Momo. I didn't even know I wanted this, she kissed the heiress with the same intensity. My girlfriend. Seeing Momo and Itsuka kiss caused Izuku's brain to short circuit some. A giggle and a little voice called them back. D-A-D-D-A, Mama swings. Izuku stood up and took his girlfriend's hands as they walked over, under his breath, he whispered. As you wish. That night. It should have been awkward, but it was easy, they had done this dance so often that it was simple. The three of them had spent so much time together doing things as a family it was just made easier by being able to touch each other. Inari was having the time of her life hugging and being together as her mom is, and daddy played with her all around the park. She even took a nap on the blanket after lunch, looking adorable as the rays of sunlight would peek past the trees and dance across her face. Momo was lying beside Inari on the blanket, a dreamy look on her face as she absently brushed a stray strand of hair away. How are we going to address this back at school? Izuku asked. I don't care what anyone says, Momo whispered. I don't want to hold anything back. I am a little worried about the reactions I will get. Itsuka said, leaning against Izuku, her hand tracing small circles on his chest. But I am not ashamed. I don't want to be ashamed. So I say we take it naturally, and what happens, happens. I imagine it is going to cause quite the stir. It will, but I don't care. He whispered. Once Inari woke up, it was back to playing games and running around the park. They eventually made their way to leave Momo taking the back seat this time while Itsuka sat in front, holding Izuku's hand while he drove them to the movie theater. The latest Disney film had just opened, and of course, it was a must-see as far as the real leader of the family was concerned. They went to a nice dinner afterward before finally arriving home. Momo kissed Izuku and then Itsuka before scooping Inari into her arms. I will give this one a bath before I join you in the room, care to join Itsu. Momo teased. Itsuka went red and started to fidget as Momo tilted her head back and laughed. I don't think I am ready for that yet, Itsuka replied. Which is weird because we have taken baths before, but now. I understand, I was teasing, Momo said. See you guys soon, I will message you when I go. This time, Izuku joined Itsuka in becoming a blushing mess. I often wondered why a character would get a kick out of teasing another in my novels, but I think I now understand. The blushing couple took a moment to compose themselves as they followed Momo, carrying the supplies from their day out. Momo just whisked Inari off to the bath after grabbing her pajamas and bath bag. Itsuka smiled and told Izuku she would see him in the room as he moved to the kitchen to wash out the small ice chest. Izuku Midoriya, a deep voice with a hint of a lisp rang out from behind him. As Izuku turned around, he saw Siro flip off the kitchen light and a flashlight turn on behind Minda, who was sitting on the counter, legs crossed. Izuku made out Denki as the one holding the light. 
The light perfectly silhouetted the boy on the counter. It was very well orchestrated, and the presentation was great. Izuku could sense Mina's hand in all of this. It could have been intimidating if there was any real sense of danger or if it wasn't Minda sitting on the counter. Yes, Minda, he said, drying the inside of the ice chest. There are some things that need to be explained, he said slowly, deliberately, keeping his voice as low as possible. I will do what I can, Izuku said, holding back a smile. Today, before you exited the dorms for your excursion to the park, did Momo Yeyorazu kiss your cheek? His interrogator asked. Yes, she did, Izuku responded, playing into the scenario, placing the ice chest on the counter and his hands in front of him. He keeps his voice clear and calm. Why would she do such a thing? Minda said, leaning slightly forward. I do not know, sir, but I must say that the feeling was not unpleasant. I see, I see, Minda said, raising a finger to his chin. Are you expressing that you have interest in Ms. Yeyorazu? I am simply stating that receiving a kiss on the cheek from Ms. Yeyorazu was pleasant. I am sure anyone else would be happy to corroborate should they be given the opportunity. I believe Ms. Inari Midoriya can back up my claims. He retorted. Yes, I am sure that my associate, Ms. Ishido, will be able to verify that as we speak, Minda said, resuming his original posture. One final question before you go. Yes, sir. Has Ms. Inari given Ms. Yeyurazu the title of mommy, and how did that come about? She has, sir, Izuku smiled some. Ms. Inari Midoriya decided that on her own accord. Upon our return home from daycare, she announced it on her own. In the name of transparency, I feel she has also decided that Ms. Kendo is also mommy. According to second-hand knowledge, she has said, she has three mamas, one in heaven and the two I have just told you about. Mind his voice cracked, I understand, we thank you for your time, Mr. Midoriya. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. The lights went out momentarily as he saw Denki and Minda ducking behind the couch, Siro, who flipped on the kitchen light. Hey man, why are you standing around in the dark? Sari shook his head as he opened the fridge. Weird. Izuku smiled and made his way to his room. Walking inside, he saw Itsuka looking at a photo of their trip to celebrate Inari's birthday. She turned and smiled. He pushed the door closed. As it clicked, she ran across the room and jumped into his arms, her legs wrapping around her waist as the lips came together, the same fiery explosion as the night before. His hands went down and grabbed her by her toned ass to hold her in place. She moaned into his mouth as the heat continued to rise in between them. She was the one that broke first, placing her hands on his chest and pushing back slightly. She smiled as he heard a small whine escape his lips. If you keep kissing me like that, Momo and Inari will come in and catch a show. And Inari doesn't need a baby sister right now, he said. I have an appointment with Recovery Girl Monday morning, for you know. Hitsuka took a deep breath, I should do the same, but I want you. I hope you understand that. As soon as we are both cleared, I am all yours. Like a fool, Izuku pulled her in, and they started making out again. The sound of their phone message alerts was enough to pull them back to sanity. The bath. Momo and Inari, after an inspection that the shampoo was princess certified, Inari cooperated fully as a good princess should. As they slipped into the bath, Inari, distracted by her bath time toys, was the prime opportunity for Detective Ashido and Dr. Hagakure to strike. The superb part of the whole thing was that Mina wore a Sherlock-style hat, and Hagakure wore a miniature bowler hat at a jaunty angle. Wrapped in bath towels, the girls slipped into the bath on either side. Hello, Ms. Yeyurazu, Mina said with a horrible British accent. Quite the luck is running into you here. Yes, quite the luck, Toru added. Momo looked at the two girls and raised an eyebrow, Detective Ishido and Dr. Hagakure, I presume. Yes, I see our reputation proceeds us, Detective Ishido said, producing a toy pipe from her bosom. As she puffed away, a few bubbles came out. It took everything Momo had not to laugh. I trust you know why we are here. Momo was almost excited. If they were going to be Holmes and Watson, then she had no choice but to assume the role of their greatest foe, Professor Moriarty. With an air of boredom, she turned back to gaze out over the bath. Why the bath? Of course. Look, Ms. Yeyurazu, Toru said, leaning closer. Me and the good detective here don't want to take up much of your time. If you are willing to answer the questions, we can be on our way. Momo was impressed with Toru's accent. The girl had talent. Why Dr. Hagakure, obviously feigning an insult, complete with the fingertips just above her breast. I did answer the good detective's question. We are in a lady's bathhouse at that. Aside from your lovely headwear, one would assume that in your state of undress, you are here to bathe. I request you not smoke near my ward, she is still developing, and second-hand smoke is terrible. Quite right, Mina said, tucking the pipe back away, but it was too late, and Ari came over, stuck her hand down the towel, and pulled it free. After Mina showed her how to work it, bubbles filled the air, delighting the child. What else do you have hiding in your bosom? I hope no other filthy habits for my ward to pick up, Momo said with a hint of steel. I apologize, but last, and I think for my safety, I had a good mind to leave my flask at home, Mina said with a small smile, she enjoyed the game so far. But you bring up an interesting point, you refer to his precious one as your ward. Reports had recently surfaced that your title had changed to mother, is this incorrect? It was a title bestowed upon me by my ward, Momo replied confidently. That is quite interesting. How did the child's primary caretaker react to this news? Toru chimed in, now back in character. He took it rather well. 
We did attempt to correct her, but she seemed bound and determined, Momo said, popping a bubble and causing Inari to giggle. No, Mama, as she returned to her new favorite toy. All the girls paused to awe at the little princess before Mina pressed on. Is there a union between the two houses in the future? That thou plan to take the widower's hand? Mina said, fumbling through her line some. I believe that should the widower be amenable to a change in the very nature of our relationship, it would be something to take under advisement. Momo paused, placing a finger near her mouth. Would this questioning have something to do with your change of color when you gazed upon the widower the other morning? Yes, detective, what about that? Tora said, moving from around Momo to face Mina. It has seemed to me that something may have happened that you are not sharing with your esteemed colleague. Doctor, I believe we are shifting topics, Mina said, blushing. I see the very mention of the interaction has once again incited your color change. My dear detective, Momo said, now both girls were facing Mina. There was an incident, shall we say, Mina tapped her fingers together. As you are both aware, living in a new environment, sometimes we may slip into old dress habits, and thinking nothing of it, I retrieved an item to satiate my hunger. And, Tor said, he may have stumbled upon me in such a state, and he may have been in an unfamiliar state, Mina blushed even more. He may have been without a shirt. When I commented so in a friendly way, hoping to elicit a reaction of embarrassment, I assure you. She added quickly, waving her arms. He may have countered my attack with one of his drawing attention to my upper garment that was lacking in protecting my modesty, and my lower garments may have been a tad short. Then what happened? Momo asked, that hint of steel in her voice. I fled, she said quickly. I was not expecting such a counter in my clothing. Mama, why is Auntie purple? Inari said immediately, grabbing all their attention. Auntie, Nina said, pointing to herself, Inari nodded. Auntie, she said again, pointing to the floating towel that was Toru. Auntie Toru, Inari said, hugging the invisible girl. That was it. The interrogation was over, as the newly christened aunties were now the property of Princess Inari. Momo managed to get them all out of the bath so they could get dressed. She quickly texted Itsuka and Izuku to give them time to compose themselves. New routine. They were mostly composed when Momo and Inari entered. Inari leaned out of Momo's arms to Itsuka. Sing, Inari said. Really, you want me to sing to you? Itsuka said. Do you want Daddy or Momo to sing? No, just you, Mama Itsu, just you. Like the true pro that Inari was, she even made her lower lip tremble. Itsuka looked at Izuku, whose eyes were watering some, is it okay? Go ahead, he whispered. It was the first time he was being cut out, Momo sang with him, but now Inari wanted to be sung to by Itsuka and Itsuka alone. He was a little jealous, but if they were all going to be a couple, then there were things he would have to share with the girls. If he allowed them to step in and take the role of mom, it meant Inari wasn't solely his. No more decisions would have to be made together regarding her future. Inari gave Izuku and Momo kisses before being carried off to her room. With practice ease, Itsuka tucked Inari underneath her blankets and heard the little girl whisper her goodnight to the picture of Sujin. Itsuka looked to the photo and then the little girl as she clutched her all might plush tight. Itsuka leaned down and lightly stroked Inari's head as she began her song. Song of the Sea, by Nalwen Leroy. Hush now, most warren. Close your eyes and sleep. Waltzing the waves. Diving in the deep. Stars are shining bright. The wind is on the rise. Whispering words. Of long lost lullabies. Itsuka's voice drifted softly like a wave. Washing over Inari, the little girl smiled. Itsuka's mind drifted to her grandmother singing this song while they sat on the pier one summer evening. The light was fading over the horizon, the magical colors of the evening sun. Oh, won't you come with me? Where the moon is made of gold. And in the morning sun, we'll be sailing. Oh, won't you come with me? Where the ocean meets the sky. And as the clouds roll by, we'll sing the song of the sea. I had a dream last night, and heard the sweetest sound. I saw a great white light, and dancers in the round. She thought of Suijin looking down on them now. Silently, she asked for her blessing. A pang of guilt took hold. Here, Itsuka was on the verge of everything she wanted, but all it took was for Sujin to be gone. Castles in the sand, cradles in the trees. Don't cry, I'll see you by and by. Oh, won't you come with me? Where the moon is made of gold, and in the morning sun, we'll be sailing. Thankfully, Inari's eyes had already drifted close as the tears slowly carved a path down Itsuka's cheeks. Her thoughts drifted to her friend, her best friend. Her laugh and smile, how Suijin would make them spend time together, and how Suijin would hold Itsuka tight every time they said goodbye. Oh, won't you come with me? Where the ocean meets the sky, and as the clouds roll by, we'll sing the song of the sea. Was it wrong? It was all wrong. Itsuka was a terrible person, she needed to leave. She should run, leave this all behind. It was wrong of her to have this when Suijin, who was responsible for so much of it, was not here. Rolling, 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 rolling. How could this be okay? How? Because you are my best friend, and you are his best friend. Suijin's words filled her mind. She held onto her chest, trying to finish the song. She felt a warmth spread across her. It started at her back, slowly enveloping her. It was akin to being held tight. Oh, won't you come with me? Where the moon is made of gold. And in the morning sun, we'll be sailing free. A whisper danced upon the melody. Take care of them for me, Itsu, I love you. Oh, won't you come with me? Where the ocean meets the sky. And as the clouds roll by, 
will sing the song of the sea. As the embrace gradually loosened, Itsuka gazed down at the slumbering Inari. The last words of the song slipped from her lips while she wondered if what she felt was real or just a figment of her imagination. However, she decided it didn't matter and let the uncertainty slip away. Grago Dio, I swear, Suijin, I will watch over her, protect her, and ensure she knows everything about you. I swear I love her with all my heart, her and Izuku, but you already know that, don't you? She thought in a silent prayer. She stepped out of the room into Izuku's embrace. Are you okay? He whispered as Momo reached past and gently closed the door. I just was wondering if this was all really okay, you and I being together, being a mother to Inari with Suijin being gone. She whispered back. But I felt like I could feel her, and she told me to take care of you too. That is what I am going to do. She would want us to be happy, and if us being together is what makes us happy, I know she would be okay with that. He said, hugging her close. Momo hugged her from behind. Then we just have to make sure we do it right so when we see her again, we do so with our heads held high, Momo said. The three stood that way for a bit before they went to the couch and turned on a show to watch. Momo and Itsuka were very interested in the historical drama, romance. Still, soon, Izuku found himself being pulled into the plot when this strange cloaked duke began to plot from the shadows. After the third episode, it was time to say goodnight. Itsuka first kissed Momo tenderly before it began to deepen, leaving them both breathless and Izuku rebooting. Itsuka then kissed Izuku, they could rein themselves in from the firestorm that usually occurred before she left for the night. Momo gently pushed him down to a sitting position on the couch before straddling his lap and kissing him passionately, her hand trailing along his chest and back. His hands ran up and down her back slowly, timidly following to her hip and then around her rear. Momo broke apart enough to tell him, please don't stop now, her breathless, husky voice was all needed. As he grabbed a hold, she let loose a small leap before she found herself grinding against him. She then tilted his head to the side and began to kiss and nip at his collarbone. She lit up in delight at his moans of pleasure. She pulled his face to her neck so she could enjoy the sensations as well. Her eyes shot open at the sensation when his hand moved from her ass to grab her breast. When he went to pull his hand away, she grabbed it and put it back. I will tell you when to stop, she said, looking down at him, her hungry, lust-filled eyes boring a hole into him. They made out like this for a while before Momo broke apart. I think that is enough for tonight, she whispered. I will see you in Inari in the morning, my love. She leaned and kissed him tenderly, a soft lingering kiss that carried hope and promises for the future. She smiled as she left him stunned, barely managing a good night before she exited. She floated up the stairs to her room. The day she had turned out just like she had dreamed. Monday, Momo and Izuku managed to play it cool but not so cool that people's curiosity was not piqued. When the Itsuka arrived, she acted normal, focusing on Inari before the three of them left together to drop the little girl at daycare. As they approached, Izuku heard his name being called and turned to see Rene Shida coming. Izuku told the girls to go ahead and take Inari to daycare and that he would meet them at the coffee cart. I was wondering if you considered what I asked you about the presentation, if not, I have to do my backup plan, but I would much rather pick your brain. She said, putting her hands together in a pleading motion. I am not too sure, Izuku said, rubbing his head, how about we meet at lunch and see how it goes, and if I feel okay, we can do something again later. I like your style there, lunch date before dinner, I get it, Ren said smiling. That's not. Ren's laughter cut him off. I was just teasing you. How about we meet by the big tree in the quad at lunch? There is a table there, and we can talk there. Sounds good, Izuku said as the girl skipped away, her last words of toddles hanging in the air. Izuku made it over to the cart and placed an order for himself and the girls as they walked up. Who was the girl Itsuka? Itsuka asked, taking her drink and kissing his cheek. Ren Ishida. Izuku smiled as he handed Momo hers, and she mirrored Itsuka's thanks. First year business course, I meet her on Friday. They have to make some proposal, and she found out I am a single dad, so she wants to talk to me and write something up. Are you going to do it? Momo asked as they started walking towards their classes. We are going to meet at lunch, he replied. If all goes well, maybe again to help her finish her project. You are too nice sometimes, Itsuka said. But that is what makes you, well you. Izuku looked at his phone real quick. I have got to run. I have an appointment with Recovery Girl for that thing. He blushed, and so did Itsuka before he ran off. Well, now, Momo said teasingly. What was all that about? And nothing. Itsuka stammered, trying to walk away. Momo caught up and slipped her arm over Itsuka's shoulders. Doesn't sound like nothing. She almost purred. Can't have my girlfriend keeping secrets now, can I? Itsuka hung her head and blushed even worse. So when I kissed him, Izuku was very confused as to why when Momo would glance at him, she would immediately turn away and blush. Lunch. So I will ask you a series of questions. Feel free to answer, don't answer. Ren began. These are meant to get to know you better, and if anything from these I feel will be valuable for the proposal, I will clear it with you first, sound good. Izuku nodded. I know that you said your daughter's mother is no longer with us, I am sorry about that, but do you think she would approve of you becoming a hero now that you are the sole remaining parent? She asked a recorder sitting between them, her notebook open pen at the ready. Her name was Suijin, Izuku said, pausing. Suijin always pushed me to follow my dream of becoming a hero no matter the circumstances, even when it was believed I was quirkless. Quirkless, Rin said, writing it down in her notebook. 
My quirk didn't manifest until extremely late in life. In fact, it awoke after I lost my mother and got into an incident with someone at school, Izuku said. Sorry to interrupt, but would you go into more detail? Suijin was forced to move away suddenly due to her parents' work, Izuku said, remembering to choose his words carefully. That same weekend, my mother had gone on a weekend getaway on her return trip. The person she was with lost control of the vehicle and my mother was killed. Your father, gone. How did you care for yourself afterward? Ren said, leaning forward. My mom had prepared everything, Izuku said, his voice tinged with sadness. It wasn't like I was rich, but I would be cared for past my schooling. She never got to see my quirk. What was life like being quirkless? Ren asked, her voice rather calm. It opened the world's prejudice for me to see, the quirkless of society are treated worse than garbage, as disposable as a piece of paper. Being on the outside also showed me how people's view on quirks is a large part of the strife in this world. Izuku said, confidence coming to his voice, replacing the hint of sadness. Quirks, no matter the quirk, is a blessing, and for someone to look at another's and deem it useless or villainous is just wrong. No matter the quirk, no matter the quirk. He replied, blood quirks, she said. Some people crave blood like vampires if they have a blood quirk, or others can destroy things with just a touch. What about those people? Give the people who need blood well blood, he said. It is not their fault. It is a dietary need, like how Geotech has to eat rocks to fuel his quirk. Vlad King needs blood, Scavo has to eat raw hot peppers, Fat Gum has to eat an enormous amount of food, etc. Every quirk can be used for the betterment of society if that is what the person wants. If they don't want that, we should teach them to control their quirks in schools as soon as they manifest. I don't think many villains out there want to be villains. What do you mean they don't want to be villains? She said, setting the pen down. Most crimes are robbery and theft. People who are hungry or trying to survive. He said, holding up a finger. Why? Because their quirks were deemed villainous or not good enough for something. Was it because something in their past pushed them down a road they couldn't come back from because no one helped them to understand and manage their quirk? What if they attacked and hurt someone? She countered. What if their parents refused to help or force them to hide what they were? In answer to the first part of your question, why? Why did they attack someone? Finding out the why is always important. Two, it goes back to one. Were they denied something that they needed to maintain control of? If yes, the parents need to be held responsible, and the child needs help. If we were helping children in school when their quirks manifested, this could be headed off before it became a problem. Izuku made sure to make eye contact with Ren. This question of villainous quirks had come up a lot over the last few days. Something in his mind told him that this line of questioning was very important and had to be handled well. Okay, this person hurt someone, had no help, and ran into the world. They have hurt more people, they come to you and say help me, Mr. Hero. He noticed her eyes were locked on his, boring into his soul. What do you do? Get them help, Izuku said. If someone comes to you and says they want help, that means they are trying to change, to get better. They may stumble or backslide, change isn't overnight, no matter how much we wish it were. But I would help them. Would you defend them? Yes, he responded. When I was young, I dreamed of being a hero like All Might and saving people with a smile. Now, I still want to save people, but I want to make this world better, not just for me but for my daughter. And by improving the lives of others, that will make the world a better place. Helping people should be a hero's number one priority, all people. Not just for the fame or glory because it is the right thing to do. I would like to do my project with you. She said, message me so we can set up a time. She quickly packed up her things and left. The bell rang as she stepped away from the table. Monday heroics. All right, kids, Midnight said with a whip snap. We are going to do physical training for most of you others. We have some special assignments. Don't forget we have our joint rescue training with 1B on Wednesday, and I want everyone to do their best so I can rub it in Vlad's face. Yes, S-E-N-S-E-I. The class called back. Midoriya, report to training ground theta for Nejair Hado. Bakugo, Ashido, Yayarazu, Takoyami, and Todoroki, you two are to report to training ground gamma. Sato, Kota, Kirishima, Shoji, and Ida training ground epsilon. Minda, you are to report to the principal's office. The rest of you, this is my personal friend Impact from America. Treat him with respect and follow his instructions. A monster of a man, 6'6 six, six and wide as a house, stepped up in a pair of black slacks and a white button-down shirt rolled up to his elbows, muscles upon muscles on display. Thank you, Midnight, the rest of you, we will practice hand-to-hand -hand combat and the ancient art of self-defense. Ajiro, step up, and let's go through some moves. The rest of you pay attention as you are up next. Training Ground Theta Izuku hurried to the training ground. As he entered the room, he was captivated by a stunning girl with periwinkle hair effortlessly maneuvering through an aerial obstacle course. He was so mesmerized by her grace and proficiency that he didn't notice the two boys in the room until the blonde, who resembled All Might, began counting down. The second boy, with indigo hair and eyes, was stationed in the corner with a stopwatch. A girl he assumed was Nejair Hado landed in the target circle, and the second boy quietly said four seconds. Nejair jumped up, pumping her fist into the air, the blonde noticed me and smiled. Hey, you must be Izuku Midoriya, he said as he waved him over. Returning the smile, Izuku made his way over to the group and bowed. As he raised, he was greeted by Nejair being extremely close, too close. Her eyes are stunning. 
Hi, Midoriya, or can I call you Izuku, or maybe Izu? That one is good, Izu. I am Nejire, but call me Senpai. I have always wanted to be called Senpai. You will do it right, my Kohai, call me Senpai. Her eyes were shown with deep pleading to them as if all that was needed to make the world right was to agree. Izuku couldn't resist and nodded. Nejire smiled and hugged him, making Izuku blush. It was a brief hug, but she had pulled his head down to ample bosom. She released him as her smile dazzled him. So what is your quirk? I heard it was psychokinesis or something. How does it have anything to do with flying? Is it stylish jumping or falling with style? I can teach you how to fall with style. I always fell when I started, I would get tired, and boom, down I went. It was not very fun, but eventually, you get used to it, that is how gravity works. What goes up must come down. So tell me, can you fly, or is it falling? It took Izuku a second to find his voice. During this time, the blonde pulled Nejire back, which caused the girl to form the cutest pout as she whined out, M-I-R-I-O. My quirk is psychokinesis, Izuku began. When it first started, I was able to move small objects but then found that spreading through my body increased my strength, and recently, I have been able to concentrate on my feet, allowing me to float or fall with style. To demonstrate, he floated off the ground briefly. Nejire clapped excitedly, Izuku turned to the boys, extending his hand, hoping for an introduction. Iro immediately responded with a smile as he introduced himself and jerked his thumb over his shoulder, raising the indigo guy as Tamaki Amajiki. He is timid, just so that you know. Myro added. Myro explained that they were known as the Big Three, as they were at the top of their classes and commonly given credit as the strongest students in UA. Izuku's eyes danced as he wanted to ask about their quirks desperately. Still, before he could, Nejire grabbed his hand and pulled him behind her. Am I or I No. He is my Koei. No fighting him till later. Izuku was stunned as he watched Mirio smile and rub the back of his head. I was only going to fight him a little bit. But fine, Nejire, I will watch for now. He looked past Nejire. We can spar later, he said with a wink before stepping away to stand with Tamaki. Okay, Kohei, can you only float or move around? How high can you float? Does it go fast? Does it only go up and down? Can you carry anyone while you do it? How about spins? Can you spin? Nejire pushed into the air, momentarily spinning before lowering herself gracefully to the ground. I can move around, it is smooth, but only if I go very slowly. Going up is easy, I haven't tried to do it too fast, but coming down is slower unless I cut it off and fall. I have never tested how far I can go, but now I can go higher in the first year dorms. I have carried my daughter some, but recently, I carried someone else plus her, and we did a slow spin like a dance. You answered all my questions in order, my cute Kohei, that is awesome. Wait, did you say you have a daughter? Dude, you have a kid. Mirio added. Tamaki looked at Izuku with surprise as well. I do have a daughter, Izuku replied, feeling a bit defensive as he was unsure how they would react. I wasn't aware of her existence as my girlfriend at the time kept it hidden. Sadly, she was injured during a fight between heroes and villains and later died at the hospital. Mirio placed a hand on Izuku's shoulder. Sorry for your loss. Nejire, who had tears, leaped and hugged Izuku tightly. My poor Kohei, if you need anything, just let me know. A sense of relief washed over Izuku as they hadn't reacted poorly. Thank you, senpai. He said, making Nejire smile. Do you have a picture? Can I see her? If not, I understand. Nejire said, stepping back. Like many proud parents, Izuku quickly took his phone out and shared a photo of his daughter Inari. He introduced her by name and showed a picture of Inari, Momo, and Itsuka all dressed up in princess gowns from their trip to Disneyland. Izuku mentioned that Itsuka, a red-headed girl in Class 1B, is Inari's godmother, while Momo, his friend, is in one with him. Nejire smiled at him and expressed an interest in meeting Inari one day if he would be okay with it. Izuku smiled and told his enthusiastic senpai that he would think about it but wanted to start his flying training first. Nejire jumped back and told him to lift off and try to maneuver his way around some simple obstacles the best he could. Izuku demonstrated that he could ascend quickly but had to stop to change direction, it wasn't a smooth transition. As soon as he landed, Nejire began discussing with him the sensation of movement, the force pushing against him, how he directed it, and whether he had to adjust his focus to change direction. Nejire elaborated on her method of flying using her quirk, called wave motion, which acted as a booster to alter her trajectory like thrusters. She explained that her thrusters were constantly firing, allowing her to maintain motion and change direction. If his quirk functioned more like a force around his body, he could adjust the output to control his speed and use his body to maneuver, similar to swimming through water. Izuku was surprised at how fast Nejire noticed the discrepancies in their quirk's flight usage and gave prompt instructions on how he could improve his technique. He followed her advice and tried the course again, modifying the field around him to change his path. Although he had some mishaps hitting the walls, he considered it a promising beginning. As he landed, Nejire beamed at him and explained aerodynamics further, suggesting he create a mental flight plan instead of improvising. As Izuku focused on his quirk, he recalled Torino's initial explanation in comparing his body to a car. His feet were constantly producing thrust, and when he first started, it was all gas, and he had to learn how to brake or back it off. He visualized his acceleration as pedals for his feet and his head as the steering wheel. It was similar to full cowling in some aspects, making it easier to think about. 
With his eyes closed, he concentrated on the sensation of the float and successfully propelled himself forward, maintaining a better speed and avoiding any obstacles in his path. The training continued for a few hours, with his speed and control improving with every run of the course. Where he would falter, Nedjire was right there helping him to adjust the input of force. They left the training, exchanging numbers to set up another session. It would have to be on the fly, as Nedjire had her internship, classes, and everything else. She encouraged him to try to talk to his teachers to get permission to come to Theta whenever he could do some laps, as nothing but practice would improve his skill. With a spring in his step, Izuku exited the building. Izuku thought of the connections between himself and Yagi, Yagi to Nana, and Torino. Nana to Sixth and so forth. This line of people and those they had surrounded themselves with to the one who had started this whole thing, the first and one for all. Forever married together, till death do they part. Threats. He arrived at the locker room before anyone else and was able to shower and change. As the others walked in, he was surprised that 1B was coming in with the different groups of 1A. They all looked like they had been put through the ringers. Even Bakugo looked tired, not even angry, just tired. After texting Momo and Itsuka, he said that he would wait for them so they could all retrieve Inari. Standing outside, he was looking through his phone, trying to see where he could maybe plan some dates with the girls. He blushed thinking about it and had a goofy look. When he received an image from Ren, he opened it. He saw pictures of him throughout the day, him with Inari, walking to and from the dorm, Itsuka and him on Friday at the coffee cart, in the air with Momo and Inari, his outing with Ochako, the carousel, lunch, the trio in the park, Momo and Itsuka talking, them kissing, playing with Inari, Inari taking her nap, the trio on the bench, the movie theater. The scariest one was an image of the trio hugging right outside the sliding door to his apartment, and the last one was of him leaning against the wall just moments ago. Izuku immediately activated full cowling and looked around. Momo and Itsuka emerged with most of the other girls and most of the guys. They stopped when they came out to see electricity dancing around Izuku as he scanned the tree line. Izuku, what is wrong? Momo said, her voice filled with worry. Izuku tossed his phone to her, her hand flew to her mouth as she saw the pictures. Itsuka looked over at the images and immediately began to look around. He glanced and saw Gyro, Gyro, I need you to tell me if anyone is in that direction about 200 yards. Gyro was slightly nervous by the seriousness of his voice, but quickly, she sprung into action. Someone is giggling. There, she pointed. No, wait, they are gone. Izuku grabbed his faculty phone and sent a message to Torino and All Might. Code 100, Inari in danger. Izuku saw Torino rocket above the school toward the daycare and Yoshi come busting out of the building in the same direction. He then dialed Nezu. Sir, we have a problem, another break-in has occurred. Izuku sat in the dorm's common area with Inari in his lap. The windows were shuttered due to Izuku and Inari being in lockdown, and the staff was scouring the surrounding area for the stalker who had sent a disturbing message. They were using photos provided to locate the suspected hiding spot. However, despite their hard work, the situation remained shrouded in a deepened mystery. Izuku was unaware of how deep the rabbit hole had become. The phone belonged to Ren Ishida, a first-year business course student, as suspected. When faculty had gone to Ren's apartment, the student was nowhere to be found, and in fact, the apartment was in a slight state of disarray, like whoever had been staying there had left in a hurry. Ren was from a far-off prefecture and had moved here to attend UA. When contacted, the apartment was being paid for by her parents, who had immediately caused more issues as Ren had OCD, regarding her living area and space. There was no trace of the student or where they had disappeared to, evidence of someone being held in the bathroom against their will escalated from missing person to kidnap victim. The apartment was under surveillance to see if the kidnapper would return. DNA samples were collected to see if anything could be discerned. According to the security footage and her student ID, it was discovered that the missing girl entered UA through the front gate, had lunch at the cafeteria, did not attend any classes, went to the first floor bathroom, and did not come out. No record of her badge being used was re-recorded or picked up by the security system's passive readings. It was found in an air vent in the bathroom. Other students mentioned that Ren had been acting differently the past few days before, not paying attention in class, and did not submit her homework assignments. She vanished during lunch as soon as the bell rang. Her homeroom teacher, Mr. Shin, had some concerns and tried to talk to her, but Ren became emotional and explained that she was struggling with being away from her family, the pressure of UA, and living alone. Her phone records were being subpoenaed, and her parents were coming. Her parents commented that they hadn't heard from their daughter since Wednesday. While it was odd behavior for their daughter, they had attributed to her being simply busy. It was a normal school day, and several students were about to head home. Nezu recognized that he couldn't prevent everyone from leaving, but he planned to use this situation to promote the idea of having all students reside on campus. If all students lived on campus, it would have been more challenging for the imposter to infiltrate and remain undetected. It was possible that the imposter would have made a mistake earlier, primarily if the real Ren was held captive in the bathroom while the imposter assumed their identity. This raised the question of why the imposter spared the real Ren's life if they had already taken on their impersonation. Why keep them imprisoned in the bathroom? What benefit did it provide? 
They must have needed Ren alive for some reason, maybe due to their quirk. The kidnappers, that is. Maybe they needed something to keep up the masquerade, something that only the original could provide. Nezu was unhappy, he would find out who had done this and make them pay. Minus one a dorm. Entertaining Inari was more of a distraction. The girl would be focused on something before she would want to play outside. Thus, the girls would have to find another way to distract her. She couldn't be allowed to play outside, causing the little girl frustration, but Momo made her a mini guitar. Jaira was teaching her, i.e., letting her stum the strings, it worked until Inari pronounced that it was broken and wanted to do something else. It was very different than what they had experienced before as they couldn't necessarily let the little girl run wild, and two-year-olds are not known for their attention span. Eventually, though Disney movies won the day, as long as the others would sing the songs with her, Fumi and Achako would rotate in helping to sing as well, and Ari got Koda to sing along. The most surprising thing was when Bakugo made his way downstairs and just sat to the side, Quasi looking at his phone but more seemed to be watching the surroundings, like he was standing guard. Inari had a fun camp out in the common area with the other girls, watching movies and playing games from inside the fort that had been constructed. Despite her best efforts to stay awake, Inari eventually lost the battle and fell asleep. Mina and Toru offered to sleep in the fort with her to ensure her safety and comfort while the other girls went to bed. Izuku's friends also remained in the common area to watch until the late hours in case someone invaded suddenly. Torino was stationed on the roof and would be there all night. Izuku eventually managed to get most of everyone off to their beds. Bakugo walked over to him, Hey, as long as I am here, I won't let anyone touch her. He then went back to his post by the stairs. He watched over the sleeping girls in the tent, finally struggling to stay awake as night crept on. He was jumping at every sound, every shadow. He knew why it wasn't his safety. It was Inari's. This was a crash course in what life for him and his daughter could be. He spent the night questioning the pros and cons. Izuku had made the conscious decision to enter heroics and its dangers. When Inari came into his life, he was concerned with her financial well-being should something happen to him. Not her being in the line of fire with him. Target him fine, target his daughter, then all bets were off. Momo managed to coax him to the couch so he could get some sleep. She placed his head in her lap and lightly stroked his hair till he fell asleep. She drifted off as well, her hand on his side. It wasn't how she imagined their first time napping together, but she had been doing her best to remain calm. In truth, she was terrified. Everything had just come together, and now there was this threat of it being taken away. Someone was threatening her daughter, and when she got her hands on them, they would wish they had never been born. Dreamland. He was floating, weightless, with a feeling of warmth. Damn it, I fell asleep, that tricky girl. Yes, she is tricky, but everything is okay, and you need your sleep. A familiar voice said. As his senses returned, he was greeted by Nana in all her glory before him. He greeted her with a soft smile. I wish that were the case, but I need to wake up Nana, you know what is going on, I need to wake up. I do know what is going on, and trust me, it has managed to annoy all of us. That is why this gentleman wishes to talk to you, Nana stepped aside, and a man stood there. He was average height with white hair and green eyes with two scar-like cracks running from his forehead to his chin along the left side. Greeting ninth, I am fourth. My quirk is danger sense, and I will teach you how to use it because no one messes with our great-granddaughter. Now let's get to work, we have much to do and less time to do it in. Did you just quote Mel Brooks? Izuku asked. Comedy genius. Fourth responded with a smile. Relax, ninth, your friends are all watching over her for you, and when you and I are done, you will rest much better. Now, seventh, punch him. What? He exclaimed as he felt a sharp pain in his head before he was knocked across the area. Nana smirked at him, you have to be faster than that, Izuku. Minus one B dorms. Itsuka walked into the dorms and collapsed on the couch as the room was abuzz with all the activity. Satsuna came over and offered a cup of tea, hey, you okay? What happened after training? Someone has been stalking Izuku and Inari, she said, taking the cup gratefully and taking a sip. Someone sent him photos that shouldn't have, one of them was right outside their room. Oh, fuck, Satsuna said, catching some attention from the others. Are they okay? Do they know who the person is? No, Itsuka said, looking at her tea. Izuku mentioned that different people had come to talk to him in areas where the pictures could have been taken. So it could be a group or an individual with a shape-shifting quirk. Is little Inari unharmed? Ibarra said, coming over. Yes, the faculty rushed over to the daycare as we started to see if we could find who sent the photos. The last one was of him right outside the changing rooms. Hinoko sat next to Itsuka and hugged her. How are you holding up? Terrified, I love that little girl. And I am afraid for Izuku, she just started into the teacup. I want to be over there, but they made me return here. Their dorm is on lockdown, they have a few pros on guard duty. And what of the child? Mito said, causing people to turn and look at him. I may not like the one or be overly fond of children, but that does not mean I wish the child harm, as it is important to our classmates. From my understanding, many of them are going to sleep in the common room tonight. They have a makeshift little tent, and two girls will sleep in there with her while Izuku and some others will sleep outside of it. She responded, That is why you shouldn't be attempting to be a hero when you have a child so young, Jirota said. I wish no ill will towards this child, but maybe he should withdraw from the university for her sake. 
While that may be a valid point, my friend, Naito said, I am sure that the right decision will be made once the threat has passed either by the father or someone in the faculty. These things have a way of sorting themselves out. I think we should walk with them tomorrow, Ryaiko said, floating a plate of food over to Itsuka. Unlike some people in our class, it would be a good show of solidarity, no one should threaten a child. Yay, that is some pussy shit right there, Togaru said. Let them try something with me there, I will ensure they are buried in a small box. Everyone looked at him, shocked. Fuck them, Yui said simply. Hey, Kosai said. The kid seems nice, and I don't really know dick about the dad, but if it's important to one our classmates, then I give a shit as well. I like Inari, Manga said. Thank you, Itsuka said, setting her tea down and taking the plate of food. Set just sat back and smiled at the fact that the class was willing to rally behind Itsuka and Inari, but what Naito said rubbed her the wrong way. The next morning. Morning came, and he did his best to keep Inari to her morning routine. He made breakfast for Mina, Toru, and Bakugo as a sign of thanks. Bakugo politely declined to go to his room to prepare for the day. Of course, Itsuka was over bright and early. As he watched all three girls eating, his head started to nod. He downed his fourth cup of coffee and set about making another. Mina and Toru tried to get him to nap, but he stubbornly refused, claiming he would be okay. Having Inari go to daycare was off the agenda today. Instead, Midnight told him to bring the girl to class for her safety and his peace of mind. The arrival of a mini UA. Uniform helped lighten the situation. Nezu informed him that the scope of the investigation had increased significantly over the night but wouldn't elaborate further. He went to his room to get dressed while the girls took Inari upstairs so they could fuss over her as they put her in the little UA. Uniform. Izuku smiled, seeing her dressed like the others, and was surprised when the rest of class one was waiting in the common room, even Ojiro, who was off to the side. I think we should all walk together, Tenya said with a gentle smile. When they stepped outside, they saw 1B standing there. Nyanjiki stepped forward. Good morning, Class 1A. Itsuka told us of the situation, and we would like to walk with you this morning to drop off Inari at daycare. She is going to class with me today, Izuku said, revealing her in the little uniform. Then shall we walk to class together, he said with a bow. No one should ever make threats towards a child. I would appreciate that, Nyanjiki. Please call me Nyan, he said. As we will be dealing with each other as class president and with our joint training tomorrow, I want you to know that we will stand with you and let nothing happen to your daughter. Thank you, Nyan, Izuku said, extending his hand. The two presidents shook hands, and then Izuku turned to 1B. Thank you all for being here, it means a lot to me. The two classes began their walk to class, with Inari in the center, surrounded by all the girls from both classes. 1B walked them to their class before heading off to their own. Itsuka hugged the little girl tightly and kissed her cheek, telling her they would eat lunch today. Minus 1A. Entering the class, they saw a special desk set up sized for Inari. They all took their seat as Midnight walked in. Hello, class, she said, taking her spot at the front of the class. Hello, Inari, she called to the little girl. Hell, hello, Midnight, she said from her desk, looking around at the new surroundings. Before we begin, I want to let you know that I saw all of you come to class together with 1B, and I have to say it warmed my heart. Seeing all of you react to the situation has been amazing. I can tell you that the perpetrator is still at large, and we are following up on some leads right now. We have reason to believe that the person responsible has kidnapped Ms. Ishida and has been impersonating them. If you see Ms. Ishida, immediately keep your distance and inform a staff member, including Mr. Midoriya, as he has a staff-issued communication device. She said, looking at her class. This is an unprecedented situation. I have to ask that none of you go anywhere alone for the time being and that you travel in a minimum of a group of three. Inari, can you come here? Sweetie, the little girl ran up as Midnight held up a bracelet. I have a present for you. Inari held out her wrist as it clicked into place. A red light ran along the band before turning blue. You can go sit down now. Inari smiled as she looked at the bracelet, but she was not moving. Kayoka stood up and gently guided the little girl back to her chair. That is a tracking device. Izuku, you will receive a code to track her in real time. The bracelet cannot be removed without a special key, and an alert will be sent immediately should it be removed from her. You may share that code with whomever you wish. It will allow them to track as well. She turned her focus to the rest of the students. I know this situation may be difficult, but we ask for your patience and understanding, as Inari will be with us in class for now. Izuku immediately sent the code to Momo and Itsuka. Tomorrow, we will have our rescue training with 1B at the Unforeseen Simulation Joint. We will keep Inari here on the main campus during the training. She will be with her Pap Pap, Midnight said, smiling as Inari called out Pap Pap. Nezu and Snipe will also be with them so that she will be well watched over Izuku. She will be in his office during the training until your return to campus. Izuku nodded. He didn't like being separated, but if Nezu and Torino were with her, he was confident they could keep her safe. The rest of the morning went on without incident, Inari only providing mild distractions as she played and colored. Izuku smiled when the teachers would give her little things to do, like hand out papers. Dark Shadow had come out and was hovering near the girl. Inari would occasionally go and want to sit with the different students she was familiar with. She even walked over to Bakugo, put her arms up, and demanded up. By stomping her foot, Bakugo looked at her and sneered before allowing her to sit in his lap. 
She sat there for a while before leaving and climbing into Momo's lap, where she snuggled in and fell asleep. Momo looked so happy holding the little girl in her lap. Momo held her all through the final part of class before lunch, the little girl being startled by the bell but quickly getting over it as Momo fussed over her. Lunch. Lunch was quite the affair as the two classes joined back up and went to lunch with Itsuka carrying Inari. It was another repeat with the boys on the outside and the girls with Inari. They took over the center of the lunch room in the same way. Inari was enjoying the attention and the extra treats being slipped her way as she sat to eat. Do you know what they are planning to do about tomorrow? Itsuka asked as she wiped the corners of Inari's mouth as the little girl was enjoying her special noodles from lunch rush. She is going to be with Nezu and Torino in his office while we are training, Izuku said, smiling. I was surprised when I saw your class 1B outside the dorms. I was, too, it all started last night. I was talking with Set and my friends, and then people started saying how they had to make sure Inari was okay or that if it was important to me, then it was important to them. A few decided that threatening a child was just pure cowardice. Itsuka leaned close, you better treat me right, or I may have other options. Does that mean I should kiss you right here and now to show everyone we are together? He whispered. Itsuka began to blush some as she pulled back. No, that's okay. Hey, now what's going on over here? Set said, seeing Itsuka blushing. Oh, you know nothing, just Itsuka declaring her undying love for me, Izuku said. Itsuka tried to stammer out a denial but was not making much progress. You know how she is just a shameless flirt. I know it, she was hitting on me the other day, coming on strong. I had to tell her to slow down. Girl, I know I am hot, but relax, Setsuna takes her time. Set continued to tease. I can't help it. I have a thing for dorks with green hair, Itsuka said, finding her voice. While I would advise against pursuing any relationship with Setsuna as she is prone to mischief, Ibarra said, handing Inari another juice. You should most definitely be wary of this one here. As he has already indulged in certain activities, it fills their mind once a man has done so. That is why you must never allow a man access your flower until you are married. Momo stifled a laugh, is that so? Why is is that? Once he does, he becomes quite incorrigible, Ibarra replied without missing a beat. Even my dear father was that same way, my mother had to take a whole year off work to deal with his desires. Wait a whole year, Achako said. The spoon paused en route to her mouth. Yes, it was quite the ordeal, Ibarra stated. I hope to one day stir a man to such passion, Ryaiko added. To know such frenzy would be a blissful ordeal. A year-long honeymoon filled with sex and my husband chasing me around the house, sign me up right now, Mina added enthusiastically. I'm in, Toru said. Fuck yeah, Yui said, returning to handing Inari a cookie. It may not be as much fun as you ladies may think, Ibarra said. My mother told me that her hips, legs, and back were sore many times. The blissful ignorance that Ibarra used to lob the comedy grenade was the icing on the cake as the whole table burst into laughter. I fail to see what is so funny. It's okay, Ibarra, Kinoko said, patting the girl's shoulder. I will explain later tonight. When the lunch bell rang, the groups returned to class. Afternoon classes. English literature was surprisingly quiet as Inari decided to take a nap in the corner with her blanket wrapped around her. Momo had created some headphones for her little girl, and Kayoka provided some quiet music to lull the princess to sleep. Present Mike once began to get loud, but the death glares from the ladies of the class shut him down quickly. He felt that self-preservation was in his best interest. Art class was very much Inari's favorite part of the day as she was finger-painting under the direction of Midnight, who claimed her for the whole period. Mathematics managed to bore Inari back to sleep, cuddled up in Toru's lap. The invisible girl was reluctant for the class to end, the bell woke the sleeping princess. The walk back was the same as the morning walk, with class 1B joining them. Are steps being taken for tomorrow? Nito asked. While I may not be your fan, only the most reprehensible villains would dare to threaten a child. She is going to be in the principal's care while we are in training, Izuku said. After that, I guess it will depend on the investigation. Is there a reason you are not a fan, as you said? Now is not the time for such discussions, but once things are settled, I would be happy to explain it to you, Nito said, looking down his nose at Izuku. We should head to our dorm, Nairn called out. As most of the class left, Momo whispered to Itsuka, who nodded. The class when a girls were going to hang out in the common room with Inari and invited us 1B girls to join them. Anyone interested? The 1B girls looked at each other and nodded, heading into the dorm. I think I need to do my homework in the kitchen, Minda said, following them in. A few of the other guys nodded. Izuku went ahead in. As he started to walk to the common room, Momo intercepted him. I could use your help with something in my room, she said. My sink was draining very slowly. Would you mind checking it out? Izuku nodded, went to the closet, and got his toolbox before following her up. He stepped into Momo's room, headed towards her bathroom, and checked the sink to see it draining perfectly. Momo, there is nothing wrong with your sink. He said. I know, I lied. He heard her say from behind him. I want you to go to sleep. I can't. Yes, you can, she said, pulling him to her bed. You hardly got any sleep last night, and you are exhausted. Inari is surrounded by thirteen capable heroines in training and the other boys who will be down there trying to flirt. Let me and Itsuka be mothers and look after our little girl, and let us also be the girls who love you and look after you. Izuku was tired, exhausted. Momo wrapped her arms around him and kissed him. 
It was slow and passionate as she pulled him into bed. When they finally broke apart, she held him to her close, she could feel his breathing steadying out, and soon he was asleep. She gently moved him till she was free before slipping out of the room. When she exited, she unexpectedly encountered Beck Hugo. Is he asleep? Yes, she responded. Was there something you needed, Beck Hugo? No, I am going to go to bed as well, is there some other guys? He said, going to head down to his room. When you girls are done, wake me up so we can take over. I will do so, she said. Somewhere on campus. The child is going to be with the principal and some old man and ex-hero, I think. They said into a phone. Excellent. Were you able to place the beacon? A cold voice responded. Yes, you should be able to pick it up now. It was tricky, but I got it done. I wouldn't expect anything less from you, my boy. Tomorrow, we make our move. Yes, All Might will die after tomorrow, and this troublesome boy will be no more. Then, it will all be yours to take. You will be there to pick up all the pieces. Yes, father, after tomorrow, everything will be different. That night, Inari was fast asleep in her makeshift tent that had increased in size to accommodate all the girls. In comparison, the night watch was getting settled in the kitchen with their books and homework. Izuku looked around the counter, but Hugo, Fumi, Hajiro, Tenya, Denki, Mizo, and Shoto were there. Izuku just looked at all of them. Thank you. I owe you all one. Dark Shadow came out and quietly said, For the princess's safety, think nothing of it. Most of the others nodded. I will collect once this is over, Bakugo said as he opened his textbook. Inari is nice and should be safe, was all Shoto said. Hey Bakubro, did you understand question 4 in math today? Haiji said. Yay, it was super simple shitty hair, look you just apply this formula. Izuku was working on his assignment when his faculty phone went off. He saw the notification that I was all might calling, so he excused himself. Is everything okay? He said, as the time was nearly 5 a.m. Yes, son, Toshi responded. We have a lead on Ren, we believe she is being held a building down by the docks. I want to let you know I was supposed to be at your training tomorrow, but I won't be able to make it. If this all goes well, hopefully, we can put this to bed so your and Inari's life can return to normal. We are mobilizing now. Be safe today. I will, Dad, you as well, Izuku said, ending the call. I hope this will all be over soon. A small headache began in the back of his head, he barely even noticed it. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku became a dad at young age. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Lestat719 for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.